Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if we could just ask you to take your seats. Um, Marcus Bockering, our chair, will st shortly start. Uh, thank you for joining us. If there is an alarm going off, please make your way through the doors you've entered through and you'll be guided to a safe exit. Hope you have a lovely morning. Thank you. Welcome on this beautiful morning. Um, it's a real, real honor, I must say, uh, to have you here at CMA 10. Uh, it's a real privilege to chair the Competition and Marks Authority when we reach 10 years in action. Uh, I've only been here for part of the journey, but I can say that the t last two years have without a doubt been the most exciting and the most fulfilling of, of my career, certainly. Um, and I'm particularly proud of the really positive impact that we're having on people, on businesses, on the economy every day. But more of that later. Um, I think it's important to mark this moment, you know, 10 years since our creation, with some of the people who, from the start, have been there to help shape the approach of the country to competition, to consumer protection, uh, our partners and our friends, various former colleagues. I mean, I'm really delighted to see many of you here. It's fantastic. Um, I was going to say that it's a real privilege, and it will still be a real privilege and a pleasure to introduce uh, Minister of State Kevin Hollandrake. He's running a bit late, but he's been, as you, opponent of competition, a big supporter of the CMA. Um, so he'll, you're going to get Plan B, which is the second best, which is that I'm going to speak first, and then you get the minister. Does that work? And then after that, we'll have a panel. So as I said, it's a, it's a real honour. Um, I'd like to think about milestone moments like this, though, as much as of a chance to look forward as they are to look back. And so with that in mind, and given we have a 10-year anniversary, I'd like to ask the question, why is an impartial, independent CMA needed more than ever now and in the future? And to discover the answer uh, together, I'd like to take a very simple vantage point, which is, well, what are the opportunities that the CMA exists to create? You know, what are the problems we exist to solve? And I'd like to look at that over three time horizons, the past, the present, and the future. So in a nutshell, what were the big issues we've been tackling over the past decade? How have they changed? And how are they likely to change if you look ahead? Um, and we will address even, get, get even more into that when we get our panel to bring even more diverse perspectives. So first, a bit of context setting. I mean, as you know, the CMA was formed uh, through a merger of the Office of Fair Trading and the Competition Commission. But that wasn't simply an administrative goal to create some efficiency. It was to create a single organization that had both the mandate and the resources and capability to really enforce both the spirit and the letter of the competition and consumer protection laws that Parliament had enacted over the years. And so I think it's useful to think, well, what was Parliament's original intent? Well, I think it comes down to quite a clear understanding that if you want a vibrant economy, if you want a thriving society, if you want an economy and a society that are resilient to external shocks, well, then you need choice, you need innovation, you need investment, and that means you need competition. The single most effective lever to drive innovation, to drive productivity, to drive investment is to have fair and open and effective competition in our markets. And I think this is inherently understood by everybody. You know, we, in life as well as in business, we instinctively favor choice over constraint, you know, diversity over uniformity, you know, quality and value rather than ripoffs. And when we encounter barriers, wherever it may be, we instinctively seek for ways to overturn them. And when we see old, efficient ways of doing things just because they've always been that way, you know, we naturally, and in fact in the past, have always found various ways to overturn them and push for advancement. And when we see that some are not playing by the rules, uh, where we see some vested interest in sort of imposing their will, then in those situations we know that's not right and we tend to take action. So that was all understood. I think Parliament similarly understood that while fair, open, competitive markets are therefore really in everybody's interests. I think they also understood that competing day to day is really hard. And it's so hard that there can be a temptation for some who have a mass market power to take some unfair advantage, to take some shortcuts. 
you know, shortcuts to do away with competition, shortcuts to lock out rivals or future innovators, shortcuts to lock up a market. So competing day in, day out is really hard. I've seen that. But that's why it works. It forces us to improve. So that's the core of the fair, open, competitive markets that the CMA was established to safeguard and the consumer protections it was established to safeguard on top of that. So that's uh, where, where, where products and services win simply because of the merits and where anybody, any fair dealing competitive businesses has, a, has as good a chance as any other of, of making a living. So with that in mind, what, if we look back, what were the biggest shortcuts, the biggest opportunities which the CMA has been tackling over those years? I'd put them into four broad buckets. The first is consolidation of market power through horizontal mergers. Now, this is where two already major players who are competing for customers or market share decide to try and get together. Businesses like Sainsbury's and Asda, Viagogo and StubHub, JD Sports, Foot Asylum. You know, a common factor in these cases is when the CMA's independent panel looks at that, they determine that there is a probability of a likely lessening of competition, and that will result in the harms I've described, and therefore these mergers don't go ahead. So that's one area of work. The second, <coughs> over the last decade, has been to tackle anti-competitive behavior. Now, effectively, that means subverting the working of free and open competition. For example, using a dominant position to inflate prices of vital NHS drugs by tens of millions of pounds, or colluding together to fix the price of football shirts uh, or construction. You know, these practices are not only exploitative, they actually stunt the benefit of competition that we all want to see. And that you, could, you could argue they are economic sabotage. The third uh, big area of work to date has been opening up markets to create that powerful competitive tension, that feet to the fire dynamism, that makes such a difference. Open banking is, I think, a terrific example of that, um, but not the only one. Uh, opening up electric vehicle charging infrastructure to healthy competition, uh, recommendations which government is now taking forward to overhaul the regulation of heat, heat networks. Um, there are many such cases, and each have their own story to tell in driving more innovation, more choice, and bringing down prices, and therefore contributing to the economic growth of the country. And finally, shielding consumers from harm by enforcing breaches of competition, of consumer protection law. And that's a really core pillar of our work, and it always has been. And our action here is actually very wide-ranging, uh, from care homes to package travel to event tickets, uh, online marketplaces, uh, or claims companies make about the sustainability of their products and services. And consumers, we know, deserve to be treated fairly, but it's not just that they deserve it. Their confidence to engage in markets is what, is what will drive and sustain the growth that we all want to see. So that's why we have, for example, launched and, and, and re refreshed regularly the campaigns such as online rip-off, tip-off, to really make sure consumers understand what their rights are. So those have been sort of the four of the broad areas that, in the past, the CMA's been tackling. Um, so what are they today? How have they changed? Well, I think they've shifted in three ways. And that reflects some macroeconomic forces that are shaping, as we speak, the, the world we live in. Um, the most, in particular, you know, continued macroeconomic and geopolitical volatility, uh, a continuous technology revolution, and a destabilizing climate. You know, those three forces are really quite impactful. So when, as a CMA, we had a new leadership uh, at the end of 2022, we decided to think you know, hard about how do we anticipate these trends, these forces, and how do we adapt what we do and how we do it to make sure that we can continue to have the kind of impact we've been having. And that's why we set, in, uh, at the start of last year, our, our new long-term strategy. And that had a clear purpose, which is to help people, businesses, and the UK economy by promoting competition 
and tackling unfair behavior. But importantly, we set three medium-term ambitions with really tangible outcomes that we are committed to deliver, work on and deliver, not just in the medium term, but through the long, long term, so with that stability. So what are those? And how have they been driving the work that we've been doing, the, the change in focus? So first, the first ambition is to make sure that people can be confident they're getting great choices and a fair deal. Now, in today's times of economic hardship, what that means is that you see us, as a CMA, focusing on really essential areas of spend. You know, having somewhere to live, feeding yourself and your family, caring for yourself and your family, buying and selling online. Those are areas where we're making changes and recommendations and interventions. You know, recommendations to government on ways to bring down some of the barriers to getting more homes built and getting them built more cheaply. You know, stepping in to drive greater transparency for consumers on the prices they're paying for petrol or for the groceries that we buy every day. You know, investigating the markets for funeral care and vet services, you know, where we, we buy services at particular moments of need and where we're vulnerable to exploitation. And at the same time, we've also seen quite a determined shift to tackling the ever more sophisticated ways that some unscrupulous actors try to mislead us or pressurize us through their online sale tactics, through dark patterns in their online architecture, fake reviews, drip pricing. Um, so these are proliferating, but at the same time, we remain very alert and very active. So that's our first ambition and the work that we've been focusing on. The second ambition is for competitive, fair-dealing businesses to be able to innovate and thrive without unnecessary constraints. You know, and you won't be surprised to hear that the biggest shift here has been the way we approach digital markets. You know, we now understand a great deal, which was not clear maybe a decade ago, on the unique features of these markets from a competition perspective and from a consumer uh, protection perspective. You know, massive fixed costs, near zero distribution costs, unprecedented network effects, often at a global scale because of a universality of proposition. And that leads to, tends to lead to extremely high scalability and dependencies on platforms. And the results of that is uh, winner take most dynamics. So the critical advantages that data and computer power brings and how that makes it possible to have a position of power in one activity or one market and leverage that into multiple others quite quickly. And of course, the very pace of innovation in these markets means that if there is a harm to competition or to consumers, that can quickly spread or it can quickly lock in or it can become endemic. In a few, within a few years. And so, how have we been addressing that? Well, to the extent possible, we have been using our existing tools. Uh, so, for example, securing binding commitments from Amazon and from Meta to ensure fair competition on their online retail platforms, uh, giving independent sellers a fair chance to compete uh, there, uh, looking into the mobile ecosystems uh, into digital advertising for solutions that will protect choice and protect consumers and business customers alike. And of course, taking a quite well, quite transparently signaled decision, uh, uh, signaled over several years, to adapt our approach to how we look at technology mergers, given the distinct characteristics of digital markets. So, in, I mean, in a way, merger control has always been forward looking. But the picture in digital markets is just much more dynamic because of the pace of change of innovation, uh, if you want to protect uh, innovation. And of course, we need to take into account the basis of competition, as we do in all sectors. And the basis of competition here is a bit different. So here, you have not just consolidation of market power horizontally, for example, in cases like Adobe and Figma, but also up and down the value chain with a potential to lock up critical inputs or to lock up access to customers on, on either side of the chain, or even both in what could be an emerging new ecosystem. So we saw that, for example, when NVIDIA attempted to buy ARM uh, or the uh, cloud gaming parts of Microsoft Activision. So that's our second ambition and area of work. Our third ambition is and it sounds like a lot, but it is to help the UK economy 
grow productively and sustainably. And why do we have that? Well, because two reasons. One is, to a large extent, if we fulfill the first two ambitions, you know, if we enable choice and fair deals in as many markets as possible, if we enable competitive businesses to innovate and to thrive, then we will be, by definition, already helping the ongoing innovation and productivity growth that, that economies need. And on top of that, we know that we can have an even greater impact if we relatively prioritize markets that are strategically significant, and those tend to be markets that have a real potential to drive broad-based innovation or broad-based change in, in productivity. And that's why you see us focusing on, for example, digital markets or new technologies where we can. And we've also looked, and importantly, at what drives resilience in a more fragile uh, world, because I think uh, making sure that supply is not disrupted for some essential items is important for any economy, and we can help with that as well. And last but not least, the growth that we're looking for needs to be sustainable, and that's why, um, and, and we also think that becoming competitively advantaged in some of the sustainability technologies of the future will benefit the country. Um, but that's why we're trying to do our part using our powers, for example, by making sure that we're tackling greenwashing so people can make an informed choice uh, and enabling markets for new technologies to develop as competitively as possible and so to draw in investment. So that's the present and now I'll shift to the future. So when I look ahead, you know, those issues will shift again. And I'll talk about just one particular shift, because it is a major one. And it's again caused by the emergence of new disruptive technologies. And I'm talking, of course, about artificial intelligence. And I'll emphasize up front that it is, there's no doubt in my mind that there are tremendous potential benefits to people, businesses, and the economy from AI. But the shift, you know, the discontinuity that I want to talk about is not the technology itself. Rather, it is the fact that, unlike when we've had previous waves of innovation, especially technology innovation, unlike those previous waves, this new disruptive technology is not disrupting the established market power of established incumbent corporations. If anything, there's a risk that it could be entrenching the power further. Because to date, we've seen a whole diverse ecosystem of researchers, Investors, startups, and very large companies alike you know, combine a wealth of resources, combine their expertise, combine uh, their, their capabilities to really accelerate advances in, in AI uh, models and in how they can be applied in practice to useful tasks. But the true potential and a true value creation of that potentially game-changing technology will only be realized and widely shared if the conditions of fair, open, effective competition are sustained in the future. And there lies the issue that we need to watch out for. You know, as we highlighted in our second report on AI foundation models, which came out uh, last week, you know, we see three interlinked risks that we need to be aware of and therefore uh, try and anticipate risks to sustaining that fair, open, effective competition. First, the first risk is that a small handful of incumbent corporations, which already hold positions of market power in fairly important digital markets, start to control the critical inputs and the critical resources required to develop AI models going forward. So most importantly, computing power, data, and talent. And our report explained that firms that control these inputs may be able to restrict access to them in the future and therefore shield themselves from further competition in development. The second risk we're trying to anticipate is that those very same few corporations could start to control how consumers and how businesses practically access and deploy these models in their daily work, in their daily lives. And they can do that through controlling the key routes to market mobile ecosystems, apps, enterprise platforms, and the like. So again, those pre-existing positions could be exploited to restrict choice for customers and to limit competition in the deployment of AI. And the third risk is that the CMA identified 
an interconnected web of 90 partnerships and investments across foundation model capabilities that involve the same few corporations. So whether it's through investment, licensing, partnerships, or other arrangements, the most successful and promising innovators are being drawn in to the ecosystem of the established players. And again, that could uh, exacerbate market power. And so there is this risk that we need to be aware of, of growing concentration of market power. And we need to ask ourselves, when does that become entrenched? You know, where does that lead? You know, history tells us that it doesn't lead to very positive outcomes in terms of choice for customers, in terms of ongoing innovation, in terms of the ability for businesses to keep thriving, um, and in terms of the economy. So what are we doing now to try and mitigate these potential future issues, to try and anticipate them? Three things. <clears throat> so first, we've established some principles that we expect firms who are developing and deploying the models to apply. So access to inputs, diversity of models, you know, choice for businesses and customers about what they use, when, how. Um, fair dealing, which means no anti-competitive practices such as tying or bundling. Uh, and transparency for consumers about the risks and limitations of the models that they're using, as well as accountability for the developers and those who apply them for the output of the models. So those are the kind of principles we, we, are, we are hoping to apply. Second, clearly, we're considering quite carefully how we can put in practice the existing tools that we have, the existing powers to, to help put those principles into practice. So for example, in the CMA's cloud market investigation, the independent panel group that's carrying out the inquiry will include in their assessment what's the potential impact of foundation models, of AI models, on the provision of cloud services, as an example. We're also keeping a very close watch on AI partnerships, um, and uh, both current and emerging, and we announced last week that we'll be stepping up our merger review activities in this area. And third, um, uh, and, and this is where we can look really forward, and it's good to have the minister here because he's one of the sponsors of this, of this lever of this solution, which is that although competition is the best form of regulation to drive growth, that is understood and from everything I've said so far, it only works if there really is genuine competition. Sounds obvious to say, but that is the case. And in situations where market power has become substantial, entrenched, where effective competition is therefore lacking, uh, we need a bit more. We need some targeted and very proportionate regulation to do the job that competition is no longer around to do for us. And it's for that reason that the Digital Markets Competition and Consumers Bill is passing through the, the Parliament. And that will give the CMA additional new powers to be able to safeguard and promote competition and consumers in digital markets more effectively than we can today. And we haven't taken any provisional decisions yet on which activities, digital activities, will be tackled first. But we did make clear in our update last week that we will evaluate the developments of AI foundation models as part of that thinking on prioritization. And all of these activities, and they really reflect the collaborative approach that we're putting in place across all our work. Uh, we really are encouraging the incumbent firms to work with us, to help us to shape the markets into the positive outcomes that will benefit them, that will benefit everyone. So let me close. I've gone through a whirlwind of past, present, and future. I think we really are living through a pivotal period in economic history. I really do. And there's some global forces, macroeconomic, technological, and environmental. Those forces could bring us closer together on real progress, or they could take us further apart. And it's a time where technology has this tremendous potential to reshape the economy around the world, to reshape our lives, but it has reached a tipping point. And underpinning this, we're in at a, in a period where the balance of power between people and their elected governments and corporations could also shift in ways that might 
stay with us for decades to come. And so I think those are challenges that we have to address. I think they're challenges we can and we will rise to meet. And I strongly believe that protecting competition and protecting consumers plays a really important role in that. And I'm really, really privileged to be here with our board, with Sarah, our CEO, and with you, our partners, supporters, uh, stakeholders, to commit to playing that part together. Thank you very much. Now, we're not going to go straight into the panel because we have our minister here who I'd like to introduce, I'm very pleased, uh, Minister of State Kevin Hollandrake. Uh, Kevin uh, shares the CMA's commitment to promoting competition for the benefit of businesses, people and the economy. And he's been a real champion also for this digital markets competition and consumers bill. And it's been a real pleasure to work with him, to work with the Department for Business and Trade, and to work with the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology on that area and, and beyond. So welcome, uh, Minister. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Marcus. Um, Emblazoned on my mug I have in my office, which is a gift from my private office, is a quote. It's from an author called G.K. Chesterton. And it says, <clears throat> too much capitalism isn't too many capitalists, it's too few capitalists. And I couldn't agree more with that sentiment, clearly. And it's one I use quite often. In and I'm, I'm quite keen on my quotes. And the other quote, I think, is that... Um, I try to, that guides me in my work in the, as minister in my department, is that from Winston Churchill, who articulates the importance of this conversation better than anybody else. He said, some people see private enterprise as a predatory tiger that needs to be shot. Some people see it as a cow that they can milk. Few people see it for what it really is, and that's the strong horse that pulls the whole cart. So, and the reality is, <clears throat> the cart is bigger than ever. Because of demographics, of course, the cart that the strong horse, that is private enterprise, has to pull is bigger than ever and heavier than ever. So, um, hugely important that we get, this, we get this balance right in terms of the fine work that the CMA does and its effect on the private enterprise. And I realise the work you do... Um, it doesn't exactly um, mean this is a popularity contest, of course. I know all about that, of course, being a former estate agent turned politician. Uh, I'm probably the only person who's entered Parliament and improved his social standing. Um, but the twin forces of vested interest and ideology are very, very powerful forces, of course. Um, and I realise in the past you've been criticised, or the UK has been criticised because of some of your work has been closed for business. But nevertheless, I think that particular episode ended in you being described as tough but fair. I think that's exactly the approach we feel the CMA should take. Ideology is also a very powerful interest. And I couldn't agree more with what Marcus said. Of course we all agree that competition is the best regulator and that really you should simply keep out of the way. That will not never quite work where you have got imperfect markets, imperfect consumers, imperfect access to capital. So you, we have to intervene at times in terms of making sure the marketplace stays fair. And this, this conversation probably started in terms of how a regulator needs to be effective in controlling marketplaces back in the 19th century with the rubber barons, how they dominated vertical markets of rail, oil and steel. And we see some of those factors present in today's marketplace. So can I thank both Marcus and Sarah and your teams for what you do, often in very, very difficult circumstances. 
But many of my colleagues, of course, uh, we, at times we will point out at what we perceived as failures and how we sometimes are non-aligned with other, other jurisdictions. And I know that's because criticism, criticisms are sometimes unfair. But we should also look at your successes. And one of the huge successes in the UK has been the success of open banking. A CMA intervention in 2016 that has radically changed not just the UK economy, but also the economy worldwide. And it's given that strong horse that pulls the, the cars a huge boost. Eight million people use open banking every single day. Billions of API calls on it every single month and now copied around the world. And this has led to something that the Chancellor called uh, the smart data big bang because we're expanding the, uh, the learnings from open banking into the rest of the economy in terms of the areas of telecoms, of energy, of house buying and selling, a matter close to my heart. But most importantly, SME finance. We know the market for SME finance is by no means perfect, but we can see how the opportunities that open banking has brought to open up that ecosystem into other, other areas, open up the uh, interoperability of data sets from banking into energy, into our accountancy programs and many other things will lead to a revolution in terms of SME finance, where no longer does a, does a business simply go to its uh, bank in terms of trying to access finance, but can uh, shop from a range of providers. And not, not only that, can make sure that it is in the right place to access finance in the first place. Uh, some trials carried out by, I think, HSBC, HSBC and Walker, controlled by CFIT, uh, led to 25% increase in the number of automatic acceptances for SME finance. And as Marcus says, we're about now to enter a pivotal moment, a seismic shift, a competition revolution. We are legislating through two things, the digital protection, uh, data protection and digital information bill, but also the digital markets competition and consumer bill, which will radically change the power balance between big corporations and smaller potential businesses. The digital markets unit will be, uh, will be key to making sure that transfer of power is done wisely. And we urge you to use the power that is transferred to you proportionately and wisely. Many changes in our economy, the green transition and the work you're doing on the green, uh, uh, green claims code, the AI transition, of course, incredibly important opportunity. And the new foundation models you're working on will be important in that respect. So can I conclude by saying, happy 10th birthday. Here's to 10 more years. And here's to many more capitalists. Thank you. <laughs> so can we start our panel? Uh, we should, yeah. I'll just take a glass. It's awesome. So where would you like me to sit? Hi, how are you doing? I'm hiding. Thanks for coming. I'll hide on the end. Hello there. See Shall we move the chairs closer yeah, together? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. It'd look like we're having a conversation. I'll sit Let's there. not battle over the thing. Yeah, there, yes. Good. Thank you all for joining us. Um, you've heard uh, myself, you've heard the minister talk about some of the challenges that we're facing and really, uh, and the opportunities, and really keen to hear your perspectives on it. Before we start, could I just ask each of you to just very briefly describe who you are, what you do, and what you think about, but in a couple of sentences, and then we'll get into it. You want to start with me? Go for it. Uh, well, let's do that. Uh, I'm uh, Azim, I'm a researcher and uh, investor in early stage companies uh, and for the last 10 years I have been researching the uh, economic transition that I call the exponential transition uh, that uh, we are uh, at the early stages of. Thank you. Michelle. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Ma and I am a competition lawyer and writer and my focus is on corporate power and how to design an effective and robust competition enforcement regime. 
I'm Claire Moriarty. I'm the Chief Executive of Citizens Advice, um, and we spend our time thinking about um, the consumers who are on the, uh, the ultimate receiving end of, of, of all of this, uh, particularly people who are uh, you know, in more vulnerable circumstances, less able to assert their rights, and very much rooted in the experience that, that they have um, that we know about through our services. I'm Torsten Bell, I'm the Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation. We're an economic research institute focused on the living standards of households on low and middle incomes. Thank you, and welcome all. Thank you for joining us. Um, so we're really keen to hear from as broad a set of perspectives as possible on if we look at the future, you know, what are the biggest or some of the biggest competition and consumer protection issues that you think people, businesses, and the economy are going to be facing? And then you know, what, how, what needs to happen for the CMA to be able to tackle those? I'd love to hear each of your perspectives on that, because I know you come from very different angles. I mean, Michelle, do you want to start? Or? Sure. Yeah, happy to. Um, when I was preparing my remarks, and I, I think I've been really thinking about what are the challenges that the CMA itself will face, because I think that those are very connected to the challenges of society more broadly. Um, and I was reflecting and thinking that as a parent, I'm often in the position of cursing my past self. Um, in particular, why did I say they could do that? Um, and I think that that is potentially the biggest challenge that the CMA will face at the moment, which is I have a slightly different view of the legacy of the CMA over the last 10 years and indeed of competition enforcement worldwide um, over the last 40 years. And I think one of the biggest challenges will be how the CMA manages the shift in understanding about what is permissible in the marketplace today. And that brings out two issues. And the first is power. Um, I think that we have operated under a relatively naive understanding of power. Um, and that has been possible because we have had this uh, uh, assumption that efficiencies will overwhelm any power concerns. And that cost improvements will mean that prices will um, decrease and therefore we don't need to consider the power um, consequences on the other side. And also this kind of phrase that competition is the best regulator, this idea that competition itself will do our job for us. We actually don't need to face power directly. And I think that what that has led to is, if, if we look at the kind of enforcement history of competition, and I'm talking about not just the CMA, but more broadly, what we can see is a relatively niche um, uh, levels of intervention. So mergers, we are interested really only if we are um, uh, having fewer than three players. So six to five, five to four, even four to three, not particularly of concern. We think three is enough in general. We've looked at exclusionary abuses at the margins of markets, but we have not been really looking at exploitative abuse, and we've been looking at price fixing. And I think that what's important now, as we go into that kind of next 10 years, is naming it. Let's name corporate power. Let's name the challenges. I mean, I think both the minister and Marcus mentioned this scenario where there is not enough competition and we have market failures. Well, I think we need to look at and have a more sophisticated understanding about corporate power and how that is manifesting in the current markets. And I think the AI, uh, the AI report of the CMA last week, which starts to look at how can companies exploit um, the deployment of new technology, for example, I think is going in that, in that direction. And the second and related point is, I think, the literal elephant in the room, which is corporate bigness. Because we understand that power derives from concentration. But what about size? How big is too big? And this is where the CMA and pretty much every market in which it is intervening is facing very big players indeed now. And this issue of how can we have companies of a certain size, is it compatible with democratic um, uh, you know, democratic society, I think really comes to those points, I mean, the point that um, the minister raised around vested interests. Are we in a position where we can in bring in new information around climate, around AI risks, and actually enact our democratic will? Or are we facing entities that are effectively too big to govern? So I would say that we have these, two, these twin issues of power and corporate bigness that I see as the biggest challenges facing the CMA and society today. Thank you, and that's quite, and we'll have to go, go back to those in a second. Um, Azim, what's your perspective? Well, I, I bet you're wishing you hadn't asked uh, <laughs> Claire to answer that, that question first. What a wonderful, <laughs> uh, wonderful um, opening uh, statement. And uh, I really um, agree with this idea of, of power. It's a fundamental theme in my, uh, my, my last book, that technology is, in some sense, uh, about power. And we are obviously always struggling to measure the digital economy anyway, uh, but you can't really say that you're 
Android phone, your iPhone is, is expensive considering the, 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 the magnificent capabilities it offer. You can look at the prices of so many of these digital products and they've come down, but embedded in them is the, 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 the rule that there's no such thing as a, a free lunch. Um, and many of the harms that we've seen that have emerged from this, this control are not measured in dollars and cents, at least not in an accounting period um, that, uh, that anyone is looking at. Uh, where we are is um, at a really pivotal moment of uh, an economic transition, one that we haven't seen for a hundred years. It's very apposite that we heard about the railway um, industry. In 1900, the railway industry was the dominant sector, uh, both in the US and, and the UK, and economies are driven and shaped by particular classes of technologies, general purpose technologies. And we have two families of general purpose technologies that are emerging very, very rapidly. One is AI, uh, and the other is going to be the reshaping of the energy system uh, around uh, renewables and the, the, the market structure that renewables will, uh, will end up taking, which will be very different to the one we've seen over the last 100 years. And that's going to happen very, very quickly, I suspect, quite substantially in the lifetime of the next, uh, the next parliament. Uh, so that is uh, an important historical context that we, we, we find ourselves at, and you, know, you and your colleagues uh, find, find yourself um, at. We then have to deal with something that is, I, I find, um, intellectually quite tricky, which is that the nature of the network effects that have emerged, the nature of high upfront capital expenses and low ongoing costs is not a function of corporate strate strategy. It's a function of the technologies and the way that they interact. Uh, the fact that if you look at the, uh, the, the share of value on the stock markets today, 90% uh, of it is intangible assets, not things that you can stub your toe on. That was not the case in 1975. It was 83% uh, in, in things that you could sort of hurt if you, if you punch them. Um, and, and so, so th we have to recognize that the, the shape of the economy is going to move towards more and more of these dynamics driven by intangibles, driven by common interfaces, uh, and then ask what are the kinds of in, uh, interventions we can, we can start to make. One of the complexities is that AI in particular uh, will take the shape both of an infrastructural technology, uh, something that is essential that, that businesses will, will, will require access to in the way that they require access to electricity or broadband, but on the other hand, AI is also going to be an interface technology, the way in which consumers and firms access any of the resources that they choose to access. And those will require different way, methods of, of, of thinking. I, I think the final challenge, and I think your point about bigness is so important, and we can look at financial services um, regulation, the idea of systematically important institutions, because I think we are starting to see that in the digital space. There are capabilities from a natural, national security perspective that we will want to come from a company the size of, of, of Alphabet or Microsoft when it comes to protecting us because our, our armed forces rely on them as well. And, and so part of the, the, the balance that you will have to walk and your colleagues will have to walk will be how do we ensure the right degree of competition uh, for, for firms? How do we recognize that competition doesn't always give us the right outcomes for consumers? And how do we ensure that the, from a, a, a UK PLC or a UK and Friends uh, alliance, our digital infrastructure can be protected in a way that we've only seen it be protected right now by firms with very deep pockets and deep capabilities? Thank you. So the, the, the natural characteristics of almost scalability, scale requirements, power that comes with that um, technology. Um, Claire, if you sit there th taking the consumer mindset, is, is this, how is this relevant to them? How do they feel this? What, 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 what does it really mean for them day to day and do, do they, why should they care? Um, um, so, uh, why should they care? Because because they're on the receiving end, and I think I mean, I'll, I'll continue with the theme of power because it's so so central. So, in citizens' advice, we give people advice on on consumer issues, on debt, on housing, 
um, of course, a very broad range. The, the unifying feature is this is about people who are on the wrong side of imbalances of power. And what we try to do is to put them in a position where they're in a, in a better position in relation to uh, power. And so when you look at it uh, from that point of view, so just th three things quickly. So one of them is that we need future-proofed regulation. So traditional regulation kind of follows the problem. Um, and, you know, and we have helped to make changes because we see the problems and we can help feed them back. But the amount of time it takes to spot the problem, to persuade people there is a problem, to get the problem fixed and to allow time for the fix then to work through, it's huge. A vast amount of harm builds up in that time. And there's a real opportunity to get upstream of that. The, the FCA consumer duty is a fascinating example of saying, rather than saying, let's try and tell people what they can and can't do, to say, let's put the responsibility with the firm to think about customers, to own the issue, um, and to think about the outcomes that they're, uh, that they're trying to achieve. So I think there's a really interesting question about how that, that principle of thinking about the outcomes that you're trying to achieve, uh, how that can be translated into other sectors. So, you no, know, we deal a lot in the energy sector. What would, a con what would a consumer duty look like in energy? It's a big, big cultural change. That's why it's difficult to do, and it's very difficult to predict uh, how it's going to end up. But that's, that's one area which we think really needs looking at. Um, the other one, I mean, like everyone else, I'm going to talk about AI because it's the big thing at the moment. And and as citizens' advice, we are both thinking about how AI can help us deliver uh, our advice services um, in the best possible way and allow our advisors to work uh, really effectively. We're also preparing for the fact that lots of people are going to experience harm as a result of AI, and then they're going to need to come to us um, because AI... it, it uh, reinforces those power imbalances because you don't know what's going on. So um, <coughs> one of the things we've looked at is car insurance where people of colour pay hundreds of pounds more for car insurance. Um, and you, know, you, you can uh, try and account for all the things that you can think of why that might be so. None of them explain it. Um, nobody has yet come up with an answer of why that's happening. So that's an issue for everyone in terms of not understanding, not knowing what, how things are happening and therefore being unable to assert rights. It's also a particular risk of AI that it perpetuates existing discrimination and actually makes things worse. So there's a really uh, big set of issues. There needs to be a consumer, a consumer view built into how the regulation of AI is built up as well as the, enough advice to be there to help people when, uh, when things do go wrong. And then the last thing, and we've talked about markets failing, um, and I think what we are seeing in the moment is markets failing, you know, beyond the, the kind of the traditional argument about competition and, uh, and, and you know, the limits of competition, but actually through unaffordability. So over the last year, millions of people have uh, disconnected from energy because they can't afford their energy. A million people uh, have ceased to have broadband. Another million um, have ceased to have car insurance. And if you don't have broadband, then you really can't function in lots of ways. If you don't have car insurance, you can't drive a car, and that may well mean that you can't work. So the consequences of people being forced to exit from these markets are, are absolutely huge. It's not market failure in the kind of traditional academic sense, um, and it's not market failure that can be addressed solely by regulators, but it is, there is a really big, bigger question here about how, as society, we make sure that people can actually access these essential services. If essential services are being dealt with by markets, then we've got to have a broad enough view to make sure that they are actually accessible to people. Thank you. So, Torsten, do you agree that these are some of the big issues? Do you have a different view on some of them uh, and, and or on the solutions? Well, I'm more glad. I'm, it's quite a lot of big issues, so good luck. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I thought I'd come at this a slightly different way, which is, so I, in these kinds of things, looking ahead 10 years, then the focus does tend to be on the exciting, the technological change. I, I thought we, should, we do, should look back a little bit at the last 15 years because the, the defining feature of the British economy <coughs> is not... Everything's changing lots and lots, huge technology spreading out through firms and businesses. Mm -hmm. um, the defining feature is none of that happening, very low levels of investment and no wage growth since 2008. That is the defining feature. The, it's on the labour market side, it's on the uh, production side, and the lack of that feeding through into wages that is our defining problem. And that's why I'm a slightly more with Kevin than some of this conversation has been, which is, you know, what, what, what is competition policy for? It's definitely to protect consumers on the price when they're accessing as consumers. They, um, but it is also to drive productivity growth in the longer um, term. And that, the lack of that growth is the biggest problem we face 
right now. So we should be definitely thinking about where does AI take us in the coming years. We should be worrying about the rise in prices in the recent past, but it's the lack of wage growth over the medium term coming together with the recent rise in prices that has led to the results that Claire is uh, excellently setting out. So where does that take us? So it takes us to a bit more perkiness on some of the focus on competition, which our first two speakers brought to us. We need more competition. By then, to be less perky for those in the room um, and possibly add a bit of existential angst is we need competition. We can't put too much weight on competition policy to deliver that because competition dynamism of economies is driven by a lot of other things that are far more important than competition policy. And if we just focus, if we put all the weight of sorting out the lack of competition in our economy on competition policy, then we're going to fail. We will definitely fail. Because, and again, lots of the ways people talk about the nature of the British economy, you know, uh, they talk about as if there is more change, is more competition. That isn't really what we see on the ground. What we see is, uh, in lots of ways, less dynamism. So I'd encourage you to focus on that a bit more. Let's, so let's just take two examples of that in the product market space and then the labour market um, uh, space. So, the, um, so in, the, in the product markets, what do we see? Well, if we take a traditional competition policy perspective, we see, yes, larger firms having a slightly increased share of... Uh, revenues in the UK over the course of the 20th century so far, like about 25% increase. So they're, t they're taking up about 25% of revenues, the top 100 firms, than they were at the beginning of this century. Now, at one level, I'd probably rather that wasn't happening, all else equal. At another level, when you've seen the growth of globalisation over that phase, that's probably what you should expect to be happening. Minimum efficient scale has grown. You probably expect firms needing to be larger to compete in a global market. So you probably expect a trend in that direction. We haven't seen the same growth that you've seen in the US. Obviously, in some sectors, you should absolutely worry. But overall, I don't look at it and say, like, there's loads of red lights flashing across the economy as a whole in terms of market power as it's traditionally uh, conceived. I see lots of micro things to angst about, but I don't see a, uh, a huge problem from that perspective. I'm much more worried that if I look across the economy as a whole, I see less sectoral reallocation than I've seen, so less change between sectors than I've seen in 90 years. Right? It's not, change is not accelerating. It's the, about half the rate of sectoral change we saw in the 1980s. That was deindustrialization ramping through. Uh, I see, and it's not been this low since at least the 1930s. At the level of firms, I see less reallocation between bad firms to good firms than I've seen in a long time. That's what we should be worrying about. Because productivity growth does not come always from an individual firm getting better and adopting a new technology, even though that's the only way we ever talk about it. It comes from bad firms going out of business and some good firms growing. Okay? That is what we need if you're going to have a lot of productivity growth, a lot of wage growth comes from that happening. Everyone needs to stop thinking about productivity growth at the level of the firm leading to wage growth for workers in that firm. That is not how we have got richer since the 19th century, okay? It's bad firms closing, good firms growing, new sectors that are higher productivity growing, and that is what has come to a halt, and that is what we need to get going. Then let's come at it from the labour market perspective, because we, we don't talk about that enough in competition space. You guys have done a very good report recently. If you haven't read it, everyone in the room, you should. Uh, it tells you some things that you should have known anyway, but I know it wasn't very fashionable. There are people living in areas where there isn't a lot of competition in the labour market. Uh, get paid lower wages. Who knew that power does matter? Uh, the numbers are slightly larger than I would have thought. So the report says 10% wage hit if you live in a least competitive labour market compared to a more competitive labour market. Basically, if you live in a low paying part of the country, you will live in a less competitive labour market and there is a problem. So we should definitely focus on that. But the answer to that isn't competition policy. So I'll give you two. What is it about? It's about labour market policy. Because remember, again, or for those of you that run businesses, whenever I come to talk to boards, they say, oh, the problem today is the youth. They always move jobs every five minutes. I'm sure you say this at the CMA board, but with more respect for your employees. Uh, they, um, they say the youth nowadays, they're always moving jobs, job hopping. They never stay where they are. They never learn anything. It's all complete garbage. The youth of today stay in their jobs just the same as everyone else used to. In fact, they stay too often. Any of you that are young, there's some young in the room. You should be moving jobs more often than you are. It's the only decent way to get a pay rise in our economy. You should leave even the CMA immediately. You can, <laughs> you can come back in a few years. You will get a better pay. I absolutely guarantee it. They, um, we need more job churn, and so less is happening. They also drink less, have less sex, take less drugs. Basically, the youth have got problems. But they, um, <laughs> uh, so we should worry more about that. We also see people moving between areas less often, and no, they don't just move to London. That We see people are more worried about people 
um, often not moving to where opportunity is because that has got harder over time. And if workers can't move, like we think about capitalism as about capital, but actually, why do bad firms go bust often? Because they can't get workers. Yeah, that is what forces loads of firms to close. That's and you need them to move to good firms. That is how good firms grow. And we've stopped thinking in those terms, and that is causing us real, real problems. So you need your labour market policy to address that. Labour market power exists. That's why Kevin is responsible for the minimum wage. Because you, why do you have a minimum wage? Because labour market power exists and is imbalanced towards the interests of firms over workers. And that implies to lots of other things. And then you come to a really important product market for making the economy dynamic, the housing market, where you have also produced a good report, even if it's a bit fudged at the margins. There, but it's not your responsibility. Because what the report basically says, rightly, is, OK, there's a slightly concentrated production side here, slightly, about half of um, houses are built by about six firms. Um, but there's loads of other problems, and that probably isn't the binding constraint on building homes. The, um, it's a lot of other things, like have you met the NIMBYs of Suffolk? So that is the actual problem. And if you want your housing market sorted, you're going to have to build more homes. That will require changes well outside of the powers of competition policy. That is what we should be doing, and that will make your economy more dynamic, and that is what delivers you actual competition. Thank you. So there's some powerful themes in there, and I'd like to try and reconcile some of them, or if maybe they're not reconcilable. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, a bit more about the power and the fact that at the same time you've got concentration, and then at the same time you have, as you're describing to us, the whole tale of companies that are not being forced to become productive. Um, I'd like to also make sure we cover another big area, which is uh, climate sustainability and the technology on that, because power and competition plays into that. And if we can, we'd like to cover labour markets a bit more too. So first of all, on, the, on this first top issue, which is on the one hand, you've got a natural, uh, a natural development of ever greater scale because of the nature of the technology, not mm -hmm. because of any other issue. And that then leads to a bunch of problems but at the same time, that's not the issue that's driving productivity because you've got a lot of small firms who are not being productive either. Um, does that just mean we need a very de-averaged approach to how we deal with this? Um, instead of talking about competition policy in one way and talking about competition in one way, we need to focus here and there. Uh, what, what's your perspective on wh where we should relatively square this circle? What you're oh. Well, the 21st century British economy, I mean, Torsten has characterised it uh, very well, but it, it also lacks, uh, it, it lacks any of the firms that you identified in this uh, foundation model report uh, that you just, just put, pushed out. I mean, they're all essentially American firms. I think there may be a French one in there uh, <coughs> a, a, as well. And so uh, you're in this sort of funny, funny p position where most of these questions actually apply to, to US-based companies. And so then we have to ask the question as to, is it possible to to build that kind of dynamism uh, in uh, you know within within the UK, uh, and you know I think I think that we've learned quite a lot over the past uh, ten or fifteen years when uh, the internet started to uh, really show its metal. Governments uh, started to. Um, fate the the technology companies and and you you would see uh, the troop of, of Google and the rest go through number 10 and there was a sense somehow that that's going to improve the UK economy and I think we've, we've wised up to that and I think the fact that there is a report looking at foundation models which is not a word that existed in science even 18 months ago is testament to how much quicker uh, uh, regulators and policymakers are, are moving I mean we did not move that quickly with with social media so as a as a practical optimist, I try to pick up on these few moments. The, the fact that you are tackling these things early, the fact that we now do recognise that just by having a big Google sales office in Covent Garden does not make us a dynamic 21st century economy. I mean, that, that, that realisation is a good starting point to, to building the next. And then I think, I'm afraid I'm going to sound like a broken uh, a, a politician of the 70s and 80s, which is to say, well, you know, we've got these fantastic towns with great universities and surely we, something can, can, can come from there. Um, so, so I, I mean, I, I look at the next 10 years as um, something of an opportunity because the... The, the industrial engines are having to be re rebuilt and rewritten because of the demands of sustainability and because of the capabilities of new, new technology. And those answers aren't yet sitting in, in, in the German economy or the, or the American economy. So we have an opportunity there. Okay, so thank, thank you. So to, what, to some extent then, 
in those situations where there is really extensive market power, some form of very targeted proportionate regulation might help. But there's a whole bunch, kind of, if we can go back to you, Torsten, the whole part of the economy where another form of competition is lacking, but it's not due to big power, if what I'm hearing correctly, but where there is an insufficient competition leading to low wages, there's insufficient competition leading to a lack of improvements in productivity. So how do we address that? Is it just a different part of the economy that is not in a remit of a competition authority because it's small firms? What, what's the... Well, well, some, of the the, I mean, some of it will be in the remit within your remit because obviously there's consumer protection issues that are happening there as well. But yeah. no, overall, though, that's not, it's not primarily an issue for traditional competition um, policy. You should probably worry about it. I, would, I, I, you know, I can remember a few years ago, um, I can't remember how many years ago, so this might be unfair, but asking the CMA whether they thought competition, how competition had actually changed over the previous two decades, and the CMA didn't actually have a view. They have, now you do now produce now an annual report exactly. after we've uh, asked some ministers to ask for one. Um, <laughs> uh, but paying attention to what that wider question of how is competition uh, developing in the economy is what you should be doing, even if your, lever, your traditional lever is not going to do you much good because you're probably not going to intervene in the two corner shops merging uh, on Sheffield High Street, um, I hope, uh, anytime soon. So, n no, they, um, but it does matter. There are, I mean, to draw together some of your, this, this issue you're raising about, are we're worried about some really huge firms, and we definitely are, and we definitely don't know what the answer is to trying to govern a world where some are so large as they are. The, we shouldn't forget some of the basic economics, which is that market size matters. Okay, so what's the big thing that's actually changed? The big thing that's changed is that Britain's market size has shrunk a lot. Okay, now, and again, I don't want to sound like I'm teaching people to suck eggs here, but like some of the basic economics do, do matter, which is the scale of firms in a smaller market will be smaller, and it will be different. And that, so, for, so trade policy, for example, is doing more to reshape competition in the UK than competition policy right now. Okay, why are we going to have food manufacturing growing as a sector, but probably electronics and car manufacturing shrinking as a sector? Because trade policy's changed, and you're not going to have much to do with that. And if you try and have a lot to do with that, you're probably going to waste your um, waste your time. But that is what's actually changing: reduce competition because of l lower trade flows. Remember, we're the only G7 economy that's less open to trade than it was before the pandemic. The, um, now, this is not about whether you think this is a good or bad thing. I'm absolutely certain no one in this room's gap in their life is relitigating Brexit. But the um, uh, but it is a big economic change. And when you ask the questions about where are these firms going to be based, then market size will matter as well as where the expertise is, where the technology is, uh, where the capital is, which has driven some of these other things. And so that, that is the hard question we should be asking ourselves. And in some ways, you know, if you went back, if, if, if you had Margaret Thatcher here, which you don't, but you have her, you know, in spirit, uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, the, um, you... Uh, I think she was probably she pro estate agent. She probably was. Yeah. She loved a house sale and a purchase. Yeah. She loved it. <laughs> the, um, uh, that's why she gave everyone thirty to fifty percent discounts. Uh, the, um, now um, I've lost my train of thought. Thatcher, right? <laughs> uh, like, why did Thatcher like the single market? Okay, but right. it was not because she thought it'd be really great if Brussels set all the regulations and then we enforce that across Europe. I mean, she thought that initially, but she definitely didn't think that by the end. Okay, that wasn't what she thought. What she thought was, I don't love that bit. <laughs> But it's really good to have a large market and more competitive pressure on domestic UK firms, which, remember, had been losing relative competitiveness versus European firms for the prior 30 years. Not versus the US, where there'd been some catch-up because we bombed Europe a lot, right? So we've been catching up versus the US, but versus Europe, we've been declining. Remember in the 80s, Italy was significantly richer than us. Everyone was writing these hilarious reports now in retrospect about how the Italian economy had all these lessons to teach us about dynamic small firms. So why did you want the single market to put pressure on British firms to be able to compete? And, you know, again, I'm not going to get into the big existential question about whether you thought Margaret Thatcher did a good job or not. I reckon Kevin does. does. But, the, um, but it, on that side, it broadly did work. It did drive an increase in competition. So that is now unravelling to a significant degree. That means less competition. So other things have got, unless you want that, and that makes us poorer, right? That is lower productivity, that is lower wages, that is what will happen. Then we need, and again, don't litigate it, just focus on what you think about doing. Then you need to increase other co pre competitive pressures. And my view is that should come from, uh, from product markets and from labor markets in particular, and things like housing markets and mobility of people. That can compensate for some of that lost competitive pressure. They, um, uh, and we should get on with it. Okay, thank you. So that's a very clear message that both 
competition authorities, but also policymakers, need to be very clear-eyed about there's a multitude of levers that work in tandem or can work in opposite, and let's not put all the hope into one. And let's that's not, just kicking I'm more worried. What I'm so, really worried about, though, is, is we will so, spend all our time very excited about tech. Right. Understood. And all I'm saying is there's the entire economy. Exactly. So, and I think, Claire, you wanted to comment on this, is that right? Well, all, all I really wanted to say was, uh, can I just drag us back to people? Yes. Um, because, you know, it's really, I mean, no, it's really easy and it's very important to think about all of these very theoretical arguments, but ultimately, you know, what's important there? What is the point of any of this stuff? What is the point of competition policy? I mean, you said, Marcus, it's about, you know, great choices for consumers <coughs> and fair value. <coughs> and those, you know, the, the, the in itself, you know, some people are in a good position to exercise choices. Some people do not have the, the, the headspace even to be able to think about choices because there are so many bad things going on in their lives and everybody deserves fair value, whether or not they have the time to go and look for the best opportunities. So we, we just need to come back to that because lots of, lot, you know, fantastic 10, work, 10 years worth of work by the CMA, but my favourite quote... Um, uh, Kevin is every system is perfectly designed to produce the results it delivers, um, and so you know we have systems at the moment which are not delivering good outcomes for customers. No, so people are not able to, you know, as I say, they're not able to access services, they're not able to get their broadband, they're being done over uh, in all sorts of different ways. They're paying too much for things, and I, I just my plea would be just come back to that and think about what are the outcomes for consumers and every time there's a possible tweak to something, just go back to what's that actually going to do for people and their experience and the amount of harm that people are currently experiencing. In the but so, and let's continue with that then for a little bit, which is so <coughs> using the same frame that Torsten introduced, which is that if there's a problem, some of that can be resolved through either competition policy or consumer protection policy or how it's applied by an authority, and some of it requires other interventions. So what's, g given where your understanding of, of what the CMA can and can't do, you know, what, what could be done to make the choices, the accessibility to choice greater for the people that you are quite rightly pointing out currently lack it? What are some of the changes that could be made? So, I mean, <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm not here to tell the CMA how to do, the po do, how to do policy. I would say the, the single most important thing is to have that consumer voice at the heart of the development of policy because... There is, you know, one of the one of the kind of systemic imbalances of power is that you know companies uh, have got money to spend on this stuff, and they've got an economic. There's there's a good economic self-interested reason why you would spend money, why you would spend money on you know fighting your corner in a competition in, in a merger discussion, why you would spend money making sure that your voice is heard in in these debates. The whole of the consumer sector. Is tiny. Um, you know, we have a we have a very small ability to make our voice heard. So, in order for it to be heard at all, it needs to be put at the centre of what's going on. So that you know, in all of these debates, that's what's being heard. So, you know, I've talked about you know, making future proofing uh, regulation starting from the consumer, making companies responsible for consumer outcomes rather than making companies responsible for putting particular ticks in particular boxes, which can be gamed and where tech will always help them jump the, the fences. So how do we work with that? So future-proof regulation, think about, um, you know, think about those broader market issues, which are not wholly for regulators, but they need to be a partnership between regulators, government, business, civil society and everyone else, and then just constantly have the consumer a voice there at the heart. Thank you. So I just want to do a check because there's been a slight change in the agenda. I know. Do we have one minute or ten minutes? Five minutes for Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> Split the difference. There's always a third way. <laughs> so to give some opportunity for Q&A from the, from, from the audience, let's, if we could just finish off, if each of you could tell us your, your view on what's the one biggest risk or opportunity that we're facing in this area that we're talking about for the next decade, what is it? Well, I mean, I think the, the hardest question you have to um, address is the, the scale of the, the dominant platforms, which, as you said in your opening remarks, having new technology that uh, doesn't actually challenge the mechanisms that gave them their dominance. Yeah. Clear. I'm going to take a little bit of a liberty because I wanted to talk about climate. Um, I understand. To, just to mention that briefly. Because um, I think what I, what I think Torsten has set out really clearly is all the ways in which other aspects of how the British economy work limit the ability of the CMA to deliver this magical thing that it's supposed to deliver when we think that 
just more competition is the solution. I think there are two issues there. One is that we say to the CMA, you know, make sure there's more competition. Somebody else will deal with distribution. They will deal with productivity. They, some, you know, another department is going to deal with that. But there is no other department that's dealing with that. So, you know, how can we actually rationalise what the, D uh, the CMA's mandate is in within that context? And then the second problem is that looking at what is the CMA kind of uniquely able to do, and it's uniquely able to look at how firms coordinate within the economy, <laughs> and what can that do to kind of link in exactly with um, what, what the other panel panelists are saying in terms of the, the problems that we're facing. So specifically on climate, I mean, the CMA has been the world leader intellectually on climate and, um, and competition and how those two areas interact. But the conversation is, to my view, um, really stalled around green collaboration. And those are effectively win-win scenarios where a firm wants to do something and the CMA is probably pretty happy for it to do it because there aren't really competition concerns um, between uh, between two competitors but I'm interested in, you know, in a context of global crisis and overlapping crises and we're going to be seeing more of that coming um, we are going to need massive investment we're going to need massive levels of industrial coordination of which we are probably not used to um, happening on scales that we can't quite imagine if we were to really adapt to the risks of climate change. So the CMA, to my view, is uniquely placed to bring together those conversations amongst industry and to have the conversation about checks and balances. How can we make sure that those collaborations are being, um, you know, exploited in a way that the benefits act are actually widely shared. And um, this isn't just a kind of, uh, you know, in the realm of greenwashing and so on, we're talking about a complete rethinking of likely of how our economy works, where the jobs are, how they're going to be um, allocated, how capital is going to be allocated around the world to, to face these kind of species level crises. So I think I'm very interested in what the CMA has learned over the last kind of um, several decades that we can then bring to bear on these unique problems that we are facing. Great. Thank you. More than noted. Uh, so the, the, the question was, what's the biggest the, the risk? The biggest issue or the biggest opportunity or biggest risk? So I think the biggest risk is that the, the power imbalance uh, gets bigger, not smaller. Um, and specifically within that, that uh, discrimination, which you know we know discrimination is baked into all sorts of areas of life, and in a more kind of algorithmically driven world, discrimination just gets amplified. So it's the power imbalance generally and discrimination specifically. Very good. Last word briefly for you, Torsten, and then we'll um, open We've had many words. I mean, the, the, lack, the lack of dynamism, and actually I would say this, the lack of investment is the biggest. Like, why does, how does the British economy stand out internationally? Mm -hmm. Low levels of investment. That, that is the defining problem. It has been for about 40 um, years, and we're going to have to turn that around. In some areas, energy is the best case study. By far, the level of investment required in energy is huge over the next 10 years. That mainly sits in Ofgem rather than CMA's uh, perspective and in governments, but it's very hard. It's going to be very, very difficult. And in general, we should be optimistic that a higher investment economy is a more dynamic and a more competitive economy because bad firms find it harder to compete if their competitors are investing. And the fact that no one's been doing any investing has contributed um, to that. So how we do that is going to be... Act how, how we raise Britain's investment level over the next 10 years is the biggest problem for the country. Whether the CMA's got other angst, I'll leave you to judge. Thank you. So that's a small handful of things we could be thinking about, <laughs> uh, as well as uh, fellow policymakers uh, as well. But would would you like to add to those or, or, or subtract from them or, or change them, anybody? Could you say who you are and then uh, ask the question? I am Keith Jones, uh, currently independent, so these are just my personal views. But um, talking about the, the labour market, the old tech of public transport needs to be addressed because you don't need to move if you can get somewhere quick. Mm -hmm. And currently, certainly outside of uh, this bit of southeast England, the public transportation system is lacking and it's slow. So if you, if you have to travel, and I intuitively think more than an hour to get to work, it's a big disincentive. Uh, if you can reduce that, like through, say, a Japanese-style Shinkansen system, uh, connecting the poorer places to the richer places in terms of um, you know, wages, then you will get more flexibility in the labor market and therefore you'll get more competitive pressure. So um, that's, in a sense, for the minister, because 
you probably have more ability, but it's also for the CMA because there are many of these markets that are, you say, <coughs> price distorted in some way, and you can have an influence on it. So that would be a practical suggestion, and uh, I don't know how much time you have left, Minister, but maybe you can influence that one as well. I have many ideas. So, on we'll that. take that as noted for the Minister. We also, I also am being told that we have very limited time, so I'm going to ask one more question from the room. Sorry, I thought we were stopping at 10.30 rather than now. But... Okay, so got nine more minutes. Let, let's have some more then. <laughs> Comments, suggestions, questions for the panel. Can I make a little observation on that, that, um, uh, that intervention? Uh, I mean, we, we are in a... Um, uh, transport time uh, is, is a cost that, it, that is uh, relevant. Um, but it can also just lead to... Uh, you know, greater and greater uh, agglomeration. It doesn't necessarily uh, Im improve standards in the sort of originating uh, uh, ge geography. But there has been a change um, in the last four or five years post-COVID uh, as more companies move towards remote work, which is only relevant for, you know, 40% of the economy, uh, uh, as it were. And one of the things that's, that I've seen this in the US data is that employees who have joined firms in the last two or three years are much more likely to live twice as far away from their place of work as those who had been employed before work from home became normal. And I think that there is a path. It's not universal because it's only certain classes of, of jobs where there could be interventions, perhaps not competition interventions, that, that do expand the, the flexibility and the choices that workers have in, in certain areas. I, I'm the optimist again over here. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Over there at the back. Hi, Charlotte Crosswell, Chair of CFIT and former trustee of Open Banking. Um, Claire, sort of struck by your comments, obviously on the consumer voice and the baked in bias we have. You're just sort of interested in the panel's comments on how do we give control of people's data back to them uh, rather than to those who use it perhaps for them sometimes but against them. I, mean, I think we've just completed some work with Citizens Advice, and there's 600 data points that have to be analysed for an individual to get back on their feed. Um, and you're know, interested in how we can then you know, use that data that they can be empowered with it and make sure, as I said, that it can reset the system before it's too late. That sounds like yours, <laughs> That sounds like it's yours. Um, well, uh, I, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, uh, I, I mean, some... I mean, Part of the ways in which we use data is, I mean, we take, well, we have huge amounts of data about people who are coming to us for help. Um, um, and that, you know, because when somebody comes, we'll, you know, we'll ask them what the issue is and what the sub-issue is, and we, we kind of code that. So we then, you know, use that in aggregate to help make the case for policy changes which we think are important. So, so at that level, so can, you know, how, how, do we get the, how do we get value for people from their data? Now, that's rather different from your question about how do we give people their own data and the ability to, um, to work with it. I don't think that's something that we've... I mean, I mean it sounds like we've done something with, with uh, open banking on that. We're certainly looking at some of, the, some of the places where using things like open banking can give people more control. I think we're more in the sort of general space of how do we make sure that people have control over their own environment Data is one part of that, but actually, you know, so much of it is about whether people are listening and the ability to have one's voice heard. But even, you know, even whether or not companies are, you know, providing decent customer service and picking up the phone, because if you if a company doesn't answer the phone, then you're never going to be able to, uh, you know, sort of assert your rights with with them. Hi, uh, I'm Martin McTague, I'm Chair of the Federation of Small Businesses, and obviously my focus is going to be on SMEs. Um, picking up Torsten's challenge, I think the reason bad companies can't be outcompeted by good companies is because good companies can't get access to the finance they need Sometimes. to invest. The, the market for SME finance is fundamentally broken, it's poorly regulated, and that has to be a major factor in improving productivity. Thank you. And I see a lot of nodding faces, in that, and also from the minister, because the, hence the smart data for SMEs of finance uh, bill. So if I were to, to wrap this up, I think the, 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 the overarching message that I take away is that 
when you identify opportunities, when we identify problems, there's always a series of interventions or solutions that sit in different people's remits. So some are to do with an authority or a regulator, some are to do with government policymakers, some are to do with advocates. And the benefit, I think, of bringing people like this together to discuss these issues is that you get that combined view about how to solve a problem or how to capitalize on an opportunity. And that's something, certainly as a CMA, we, we, we promote and encourage as much as possible, also internationally. Uh, and long may it continue. So can you please uh, give your appreciation to the panel for spending their time with us? <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, I think we have a break until 10.45, is that right? Uh, 10.45. Exactly. 10.45. So we have a break and we're, people are going which way? Uh, Either. Ways. Both ways. There you go. You have the, you have the office you. floor to your disposal. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much for joining us all today as the CMA turns 10. We've already heard the expression pivotal moment used many, many times this morning. And it is a pivotal moment, not just for us as an organization, but for the UK's evolving approach to promoting competition and protecting consumers. And it's an opportunity for us both to reflect and to look to the future. As we mark our first decade of promoting competition and tackling unfair practices, it's really important to consider how our role and the environment that we operate in has changed. And we've heard that loud and clear from the previous discussion. Certainly some of the challenges that we considered, I remember back in our first shadow board meeting in Victoria House more than 10 years ago, feel very, very different from the ones that we're contemplating now. In the 10 years since then, the UK has exited the European Union. We've experienced a global pandemic, a persistent cost of living crisis, mounting concern over changing climate, and of course, unprecedented digital transformation. As an institution, we've grown in scale and in geography. We now have offices at six locations across the UK. We've set up new functions, the Office of the Internal Market, the Subsidy Advice Unit, and our really important microeconomics unit. We've heard already much reference to the work of that unit today. And of course, we stand poised to take on substantial new powers to promote competition in digital markets and to deliver robust and effective consumer protection. I am immensely proud of the positive impact that the CMA has delivered for the UK over the last decade. But as reflected in the discussion that we've heard this morning, I'm also acutely aware of the very real challenges now facing people across the UK and the UK economy. Whether it's improving productivity, economic growth and the resilience of our economy, mitigating those cost of living pressures, tackling the housing crisis, or of course, addressing the power of the large digital firms and the potentially unprecedented opportunities and risks brought about by emerging technologies like AI. Across all of these, as we've heard this morning, the CMA has an absolutely critical role to play. But we need to stay focused, stay focused on delivering the best outcomes we can for people, for businesses and our economy and critically prioritizing our work where it's needed the most. These are the core pillars of the long-term strategy that Marcus and I developed last year and which drives our action going forward. So 10 years on, there's much for us to do and I'm full of energy and optimism for the future. And I know that my feelings are shared by the whole of the CMA's senior leadership team, by Marcus, our board, and of course, across the whole of the CMA. But today isn't just a moment to reflect on 10 years of the CMA's work. It's also a watershed moment in the evolution of the UK's competition and consumer protection landscape. What comes next will inevitably be shaped by the new consumer and digital frameworks that are being brought into force by the Digital Markets Competition and Consumers Bill. And as we consider the new responsibilities that are being given to the CMA and the range of issues that we seek to address, I'd like to take this opportunity to set out quite simply why competition matters. Now, of course, we've heard from the previous panel that competition can't solve everything. But we've also heard about some of the enormous challenges facing society today in which competition can and must play a really important role. Now, that's why a robust and independent competition and consumer protection regime is essential to deliver real benefits for people, businesses and the wider UK economy. In speaking this morning, I will also address some of the critiques that we hear from time to time. For example, that competition enforcement stimmies growth and chills investment. That a UK competition should have a limited role in a globalized digital world. And that the CMA is overstepping our role in areas of policy, straying into areas which should not concern us. To be clear, we welcome this debate because we should never take for granted the mandate and the responsibility the CMA has been given by Parliament. We should always be able to enunciate clearly our purpose and coherently why competition matters. So why does competition matter? We've heard a lot already about this this morning. And we're all familiar with the theory of competition. Competition at its, at its core forces us to do our best. It's been described variously as the keen cutting edge of business, the mother of invention, the incentive to progress and the basis of protection to consumers. The theory may be clear, but we should never presume that a case for competition as a matter of theory will mean that our work speaks for itself. 
The CMA's expertise and independence are part of our strengths, but we don't work in an ivory tower. We apply our expertise to real problems facing people and businesses throughout the economy. So one of my priorities as CEO has been to focus relentlessly on the actual outcomes of our work for people, businesses, and the UK economy. When people hear about our work, I want them to know it's going to improve their lives as consumers, as taxpayers, and as stakeholders in our society. I want competitive, fair-dealing businesses to know that we're on their side when we take action against the small minority of firms who would restrict competition and harm consumers. We all have an interest in the long-term health of the UK economy, consumers, businesses, and governments alike. And I want all parts of society to know that the work of the CMA supports the wider agenda for an economy that grows productively and sustainably. So how does the CMA think about the benefits of competition in 2024? Not as technocrats or as philosophers, but as agents of real, demonstrable, positive outcomes for people, businesses, and the wider economy. Let's explore this, explore this in a little more detail. Why does competition matter for people? We all know that when competition is weak, the real cost of that is borne by all of us in the form of higher prices, lower quality, reduced choice, and poor incentives for consumer protection. And too often, those who can afford it the least are hit the hardest. Vulnerable customers, those struggling to switch and find the best deal, those struggling with the cost of living, who are more likely to fall victim to unscrupulous practices. So we are committed to promoting an environment where everybody can be confident that they're getting great choices and fair deals. And here our competition work dovetails with our critical role in enforcing consumer protection law. We've cracked down on unfair contract terms. From our work on leasehold property, we have freed thousands of homeowners from doubling ground rents that stop them from being able to sell their homes or remortgage. We're looking at online sales practices that can make people feel under pressure to buy products that they don't want or need. And we followed up on our clear guidance on making green claims about products and services with enforcement cases to show that we're serious about creating a level playing field, most recently securing key changes from fashion firms Boohoo, ASOS, and Georgia Asta. All this serves to ensure that people are protected and can feel confident when they engage with markets, that they don't feel powerless in the face of large corporations, that imbalance of power that we've just been hearing so much about. That confidence underpinned by effective markets and strong consumer protection drives growth across our economy. The DMCC bill will give the CMA new powers for the CMA to directly enforce consumer protection law with the ability to impose penalties of up to 10% of worldwide turnover. This will be a step change in our ability to safeguard people's engagement in our economy, and we are carefully considering our first cases and action in that area. Now, one example which goes to the heart of why competition really matters to people's daily lives is their ability to access and afford food. Again, we heard that from Claire just a little bit earlier today. The CMA has worked hard for a decade to keep supermarket competition strong in every town and every community across the UK. We stepped in to protect shoppers when Morrisons and Marks and Spencer breached an order not to bar rivals from opening stores nearby. We blocked Sainsbury's proposed acquisition of Asda back in 2018 after the evidence showed that it would harm consumers. We used our consumer powers to make sure supermarkets were displaying their prices clearly and fairly. And now we're looking at whether loyalty schemes are operating fairly and if it can be made easier for shoppers to identify savings. We're also taking forward a market study into baby formula where we've seen average prices rise by 25% over the last two years. Groceries is just one example amongst so many, but I think you'll agree it's a really fundamental one. And why does competition matter for businesses? We're also committed to promoting an environment where competitive, fair-dealing fair businesses can innovate and thrive. Why? Because without that competitive pressure, we see hunger for innovation and efficiency decline into apathy and stagnation. And we see incentives for investors and fair-dealing businesses wane as the unscrupulous behavior of a few goes unpunished. Now, of course, we recognize that businesses and investors want a fair return on their investment. And indeed, the ability to earn that fair return is what spurs innovation in the first place, to steal a march on others. 
But as challengers and innovators gain ground, we want market conditions that encourage rivals to snap at their heels. That creates a constant virtuous circle of investment, innovation, reward, and competition. Restrictions to effective competition can come in many forms. Markets dominated by a handful of powerful firms using their positions to prevent challenges from entering and expanding. Unequal access to key inputs, and of course, cartels and collusion. The result is the same. Poor outcomes for customers, poor outcomes for investors and businesses, and ultimately harm to our wider economy. Again, let's look at some tangible examples. We heard this example from the minister this morning, but I'll mention it again because it's a great example. Open banking, following the CMA's investigation into weak competition, stagnant innovation and retail banking, open banking was created. It spurred an explosion of digital and data-driven innovation, driven not just by the big high street banks, but also by many hundreds of challenger companies. Today, we see over 8 million users benefiting from that innovation. And as we've heard, that's a phenomenal benefit for consumers and for SMEs in the UK economy. But that's only part of the story. The UK's open banking regime has also been called the envy of the European fintech community as hundreds of ambitious, scrappy challenges, many of them, notably with international investor backing, have piled into a market that's now worth £4 billion to the UK economy. And at the more bricks and mortar end of the spectrum, quite literally in this case, is construction, a critical sector on which almost every part of our economy depends. Across 2019 and 2020, the CMA fined 12 firms providing construction services or materials more than £68 million for engaging in anti-competitive conduct that included price fixing and market sharing. 11 company directors were disqualified. In one investigation, a supplier was secretly recorded at a cartel meeting saying, guys, Lower voice, probably, guys. <laughs> look, at all, look at all our financial numbers. We've all had a good year, and that's come about by all sitting here. This is the ugly reality of anti-competitive conduct harming UK businesses and our economy today. And finally, why does competition matter for our economy? As the Nobel Prize-winning economist Paul, Paul Krugman famously put it, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it's almost everything. That's why we're committed to providing an environment where the whole UK economy can grow productively and sustainably. And we heard this from Torsten. Economic theory and history both tell us that where competition is stronger, productivity and wage growth is likely to be higher. That link between competition and productivity has been empirically established again and again at country and sector level, and notably, that correlation has also consistently been found between the existence and effectiveness of competition policy and overall productivity. And the CMA's own review of the relationship between competition and productivity also identified competitive pressure as a key driver of firm level efficiency and innovation. And importantly, again, picking up a theme from this morning, that competition is an important factor in weeding out lagging firms to create the space for productive new entrants. I'm sure there's more to be done, but it's a critical factor at play in the way our economy is working. Our new microeconomics unit is exploring this theme. Thank goodness we can now answer the question, how is competition working in our economy? We will be publishing our third State of Competition report. Thank you, John in May this year. And all of this importantly forms part of the CMA's wider contribution to the government and to broader policy thinking in these areas. We are an important contributor to a discussion and a debate about how to stimulate and strengthen our economy. And we are laser focused on this goal and fully committed to playing our part in that debate. I've got quite a long way through this talk without mentioning merger control, but it would be remiss of me to speak of stimulating our economy without talking about the, the role of merger control. And I could talk at length about many, many cases, Microsoft Activision, Sabre Fair Logix, NVIDIA Arm, Illumina Pack Bio, to name but a few. Examples of cases where markets were kept open for challenges and innovators, where prices were kept fair for consumers and where investment has continued to flow. I read with interest that Foot Asylum which at the time we blocked its acquisition by JD Sports was described as a declining force suffering serious short-term issues, has recently posted record sales and profits and is now expanding internationally. I'm really pleased for them and for their consumers. 
But I'm also delighted by the story of turnaround and growth and expansion and the wider benefits these cases have for the UK economy. And I'm looking forward to hearing just a little bit later from Justin, one of our new non-executive directors, CEO of ClearScore, about his personal experience of UK merge control. <laughs> So what are all these benefits across people, across businesses and the wider economy? What does that add up to? Since the CMA was created, we have routinely measured the direct financial benefit that the CMA delivers to UK taxpayers. In the three years between 2020 and 2023, for every one pound that we spent on our operating costs, the CMA delivered an average benefit to consumers of 26 pounds. Since 2014, when we were established, the CMA has delivered at least £15.6 billion pounds worth of benefits for consumers directly from cases, our mergers cases, our markets cases, our cartels work, and so on. And of course, the direct consumer benefit does not include the potentially much greater indirect effect of our work. How many businesses, I hope many, are deterred from breaking the rules because they see the penalties that are imposed on those who do? How many companies double down on their own strategies for growth and innovation because they know that an anti-competitive merger would be blocked? Analysis suggests that the overall positive impact of our work could be much, much higher than the figures that I've just shared with you. Now, some of you might say, of course I would say this, I'm the chief executive of the CMA. That makes it no less true. But I would like to address just three of the challenges and the critiques that we hear leveled against us. First, that the CMA is anti-mergers and anti-business, and that effective competition enforcement deters investment. Let's start with mergers. It's true that post-Brexit, the CMA has played a greater role in, revu in reviewing global deals. These can involve large numbers and big names. But headline-driven hyperbole can sometimes get in the way of the facts. So let me lay out a few facts for you now. Over 2023, approximately 50,000 M&A deals were identified over that period, the CMA looked at around 700 cases. Of those, we carried out 43 phase one investigations, 13 phase two investigations, we blocked three deals, and a further three deals were abandoned. This is less than 1% of the total number that we looked at, really focusing in on the handful of truly problematic deals where appropriate solutions cannot be found. So whilst we will not shy away from taking and defending, robust decisions to prevent anti-competitive mergers, which would harm the UK. We are about evidence and outcomes, not ideology. And what impact does the UK's competition regime really have on investors? Competition enforcement, merger control included, is not a bureaucratic hurdle that runs contrary to free market principles. It's actually a fundamental safeguard for them. It's in the interest of every fair dealing company operating or investing in the UK to have a robust, independent UK competition authority protecting free and open markets. Our independent authorities, our courts, our tribunals, our robust and our transparent processes, these are all major reasons why the UK is an attractive destination for investment. And we have seen what happens when competition is absent. Markets characterized by high concentration or even monopolies leading to higher prices, lower quality, and stimmied innovation. Now, a business which distorts competition to hike prices might well feel like a lucrative investment opportunity for its backers. But I think we all agree, we want an economy where returns to investment are earned by serving consumers, innovating to outstrip your rivals, spurred on by healthy competition, and backed by effective competition enforcement. Second, it's been suggested that the CMA oversteps its role in the global economy. Let me be clear. The CMA's mandate post-Brexit is to protect competition in the interests of UK consumers and UK businesses. If there are global mergers involving non-UK companies, which would lead to higher prices or less choice for UK consumers, if there are global companies exploiting their positions of market power to exclude an innovative UK startup or setting unreasonable terms to prevent those UK businesses from using their essential trading platforms, we will not hesitate to take action. That's our job. And we can't rely on the US or the EU competition authorities to do it for us. The CMA will take independent decisions to deliver the best outcomes for UK consumers, but we don't carry out our work in isolation. In this globalized world of interconnected markets, international cooperation and communication are more important than ever. 
And that's why we're working increasingly closely with our partners across the globe, sharing information, sharing best practice, learning from one another, aligning where appropriate on timing and process, whilst of course retaining sovereignty over our decisions. And all of this, I think, has demonstrably strengthened the impact of our interventions, whether that's in mergers, in cartels, or increasingly in technology-driven global markets. And it's often resulted in more aligned outcomes across different jurisdictions, which of course helps minimize regulatory burden for business. Now, finally, it's sometimes said that the CMA oversteps the bounds of its role as a competition and consumer protection authority, that we're meddling in areas that have little to do with our remit. What have AI safety, labor markets, or net zero to do with us, goes the argument. Now, I think we've heard from the previous panel, in fact, they have an awful lot to do with us, and that's certainly our view. It's important to be clear here. We recognize that competition policy cannot solve all of the challenges facing the UK. We've heard that loud and clear. And we rightly operate within a legal framework that imposes limits on our powers. But critically, I think, from my Marxist perspective, we have an important role to play in these broader debates. We need to ensure that the connections with competition and consumer protection concerns are recognized and understood. You can see this through our work on AI foundation models, which has spurred an international conversation about how these, model, how these models and markets can be guided towards positive outcomes through our work, through the sustainability task force on the green agreements guidance we publish so companies can be confident in fulfilling their sustainability potential without breaking the law. And again, the discussion that we had just now uh, talking about our work in labor markets, the Microeconomics Unit's flagship research piece on labor markets, which, when functioning well, are widely recognized as an important driver of economic growth. To conclude, I hope it's been evident in what you've heard so far today that the CMA at 10 is more clear-sighted than ever about the challenges that lie ahead. That each new challenge or critique that we face deepens our resolve to deliver for the UK and that we are actively evolving in the face of widespread change. All of which gives me great confidence that the next 10 years will be even more impactful for the UK than the last 10. And it's a pleasure to start that journey with you here today. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, you can now. Excellent. OK. Um, so you've heard quite a lot already. Um, you may be slightly breathless at this point. I know I am. We're coming to our final session um, of the morning. My name is Jessica Leonard. I'm the CMA's Chief Strategy and External Affairs Officer. Our final panel um, is the next decade of promoting competition and protecting consumers. I have a fantastic all CMA, all star lineup for you. I'm going to invite them to come up onto the stage now, please. Someone's stolen my pen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Fantastic. OK. Um, <clears throat> so for this panel, um, what we hope to do for you a little bit is lift the bonnet on um, how the CMA works how we're thinking about the next 10 years, how we're set up for the next 10 years. So you heard the big picture piece this morning from Marcus and that fantastic panel. We want to bring it back a little bit to the day in, day out. But I think um, we've just had such a fantastic and rich and thought-provoking discussion this morning that we're also going to jump in to some of the issues that you've heard already today um, and discuss some of those as well. So I'm first of all going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, please, um, right to left. Hi, morning, everybody. I'm Karen Crooks, and I'm the Chief Data Technology and Insight Officer. I'm Sarah Cardar, Chief Executive. I'm Martin Coleman. I'm a non-executive member of the CMA board, and I chair the independent panel that investigates merge, phase two mergers, that conducts market investigations, and hears appeals from the economic regulators. Hello, I'm Justin Bassini. I'm the co-founder and CEO of ClearScore. Uh, delighted to be here. And I've just joined the board as a non-executive director. Fantastic. OK, thank you. Um, Sarah, I want to come to you first. We've talked a lot about the DMCC bill um, as a landmark and a watershed moment. Do you want to just to kind of explain why we talk about it in those terms? 
Yeah, I feel like we've talked a lot about pivotal moments, and watershed yes. moments today. But you know, I think it, there's a risk of overuse. But I think it's really, it's really true. So maybe just to talk first about digital, and then I'd like to come on to, to the consumer side. Um, look, we've we've talked a lot about digital change, the importance of digital markets, the 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 clear evidence that we have before us of the concentration of market power across a num number of these markets. And we've talked also a lot about the huge benefits, and let's not forget the huge benefits that these technologies can bring for, for people in terms of vast new choices, product services, improving the way we live our lives, the way we do our work. For businesses, I think it really is a, a, a real opportunity to unlock innovation and growth and productivity, and of course that supports the economy. So there is a there is a huge opportunity here, and that is why it is, I think, such a pivotal moment, because we're not at the moment unlocking that opportunity. We're not unlocking it, I think, properly on a global scale, but we're also, as we heard this morning, not unlocking it for the UK. What have we been doing so far? You know, we've certainly not been sitting idle. I think everybody knows that. So we're using our existing powers incredibly uh, fully. I'm looking at Andrea, who was very much the architect of a lot of this through, through the, the first 10 years of the CMA's work. You know, we've had absolutely um, groundbreaking work done through our digital advertising market study, our mobile ecos market study. We've got live at the moment our market investigations looking at mobile browsers and the cloud. We've had a number of antitrust investigations, but we know that that toolkit is not sufficient and it's particularly important because of the fast moving and dynamic nature of these markets. And I think this is a real priority both for Marcus and I coming in. The, the risk that we're always trying to kind of play catch up, we're always tackling yesterday's issues and, and that we really don't get to unlock and deliver those benefits. So what does the bill do? You know, it, it, it changes the terms of trade, I think. It provides us with a new framework, which as Marcus said, is much more targeted. It's much more sp bespoke. It's focusing right in on those positions of substantial and entrenched market power. And it gives us a different toolkit. It gives us the ability to manage those positions of market power where competition isn't working, as Marcus has said. It gives us the opportunity to try and unlock and open up markets and free up that competition. And I hope over time, by the way, that we're able to sort of move more from, from, from the sort of managing to the opening up. I think that should be an ambition on our part. It enables us, I, I would hope, to engage with um, these companies in a different way because I don't think that the UK economy and the people and the businesses of the UK are best served by a highly combative approach to competition enforcement in digital markets. Now, we will do our best with that. You know, we want to introduce a new regime which has a collaborative and engaged approach where we are open to having discussions, where we are looking to work with the companies to resolve issues, but it takes two to tango. You know, we've been watching what's happening in the EU with a lot of interest, and I think it will be really interesting to see how the companies choose to engage with us. But I think there is a huge opportunity here. I think there is a huge opportunity for something in the UK which is a little different from what's happening in the EU. So that's why I think it's a, it's a watershed moment on the digital side. Uh, you know, I do want to emphasize the, com the consumer side as well with the bill, because it's easy to focus in on the digital markets aspect of the bill. And actually, consumer protection is so important here. Again, we heard that from, from Claire this morning. Let's bring it back to consumers. And, and we're certainly very conscious of, of making sure we hear that consumer voice in all the work that we're doing. And, and Marcus talked about our focus on people, our focus on the areas where people are you know, making choices in areas that really matter to them. The, the consumer toolkit, again, at the moment, I think, you know, we have done George leading the, leading the work for the CMA over the past few years, Nisha, who set it up you know, right, right back at the beginning. I think we've done great work with the toolkit that we have. I think we've delivered some really important benefits for people. Talked about leasehold as an example of that. Green claims, many other areas. But it's, it's, it's a fundamentally deficient regime at the moment. You know, in particular, the absence of any financial penalties is, is a really weak deterrent. So the new regime bringing in the ability to impose penalties of up to 10% of turnover, importantly enabling us to take cases through to a final decision so we don't have to litigate those cases in the first instance. I think that's going to be quite groundbreaking. And I think and I hope it will create a step change in understanding and compliance across the business community in relation to consumer protection. Again, you know, I would emphasize the same point. We are looking to businesses to engage constructively here, to move the way that they operate, to really think deeply about their practices, to ensure that they are compliant. Part of our 
um, approach with the new regime will be to put out guidance to make it clear what our expectations are for businesses in different areas, but then to follow that up very clearly with sharp-edged and effective enforcement where we see lagger like, companies who are choosing not to comply. So I, I am hugely optimistic that actually this bill can deliver a real change in outcomes for, for people and businesses in the UK, and that ultimately is our objective. But it does depend on the businesses and their advisors, I would say, to this room, their, their commitment to engage in this. Actually, I would hope with everybody having a common aspiration to improve outcomes for the UK. Thank you so much. And, you know, obviously you've talked about new powers, we talk about new responsibilities, and we heard the minister this morning expressing his, uh, his um, wish that the CMA uses them judiciously and wisely. So you know, we talk a lot, don't we, about um, with the increased powers and the expanded remit comes much, much um, a commensurate increase in accountability and transparency. And that's something we think about a lot. And that's being built into the institutional design of all of this, isn't it? So it'd be great to hear from you a little bit about that. And also I'd love Martin to come in here because obviously when it comes to the distinctive and robust CMA governance that exists, you sit in this unique position of being both on our board but also chair of the independent panel. So it'd be great to hear from you a little bit on that as well. Yeah, I mean, maybe just to kick off, look, I think that the sort of overarching point, we recognise that these are really substantial new powers and we take that very, very seriously. And in every choice that we make about where to intervene and how to intervene, we are incredible incredibly thoughtful both about what is the outcome that we're seeking to achieve are we best placed to to do that and what impact is that going to have on on businesses and other stakeholders um in terms of sort of formal accountability obviously we are accountable to parliament for everything that we do and marcus and i have spent quite a bit of the last uh, 18 months speaking to parliamentarians explaining our work and and more broadly i think you know a really i i think really quite a defining feature of our of our sort of joint leadership has been that openness and that focus on engagement. You know, we have very consciously stepped up our engagement with consumer groups, with business groups, with third sector organisations, with any and all stakeholders who have an interest in our work because, because that accountability is so important, because it is so important for us to be out explaining what we're doing, why we're doing it. And it's really important also, by the way, for us to hear from others and that informs our choices. So it's very much a, a virtuous circle. Transparency also in the way that we operate is key. I'll let Martin maybe talk about phase two reforms, which I think is a, is a good example of that. We will be publishing hopefully fairly soon our draft guidance in relation to the digital markets aspects of the of the new powers. And again, you know, that, that transparency and openness will be an absolutely defining feature of the new regime. Thank you. And Martin? So uh, can, can we just go back to this question of independence and, how it, and, the, and its importance? Because I think there are a number of aspects of independence that you have to separate. So the first is that we are independent from the parties who appear before us. And that's obviously important because we need to look at the evidence that's put to us in an open-minded, objective way. The second is that we are independent of political influence. And that matters because we take a long-term view. We apply an established set of legal and economic principles which are not swayed by, the, you know, by, 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 by political pressure. And for the panel, we are independent of the board so that we can make decisions on the facts in these major phase two cases um, without any risk of confirmation bias. But there is there's another aspect to independence that people perhaps talk about less, which is independence of thought. And that is reflected both on the board and on the panel, in part by the fact that we have on the board and on the panel some people like me have spent much of their career uh, in competition policy. But also the majority on the board and the majority on the panel are people like Justin, who come from a business background, consumer advocacy background, finance, the profession. And this diversity of thought is incredibly important. I sometimes listen to economists, not, not all economists, but some economists, and talk, they talk <laughs> Only about... Only sometimes listen to them, the rest uh, of no, no, just ignore them. <laughs> I always listen, that's part of the job. But um, when, I, when I listen, I sometimes hear them talk about consumers as if they're some kind of an economic concept. 
Mm. You know, we have, you know, you have, you, 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 you have a kind of concept of a consumer and that fits into an equation, which kind of gives you an answer. Consumers are real people. <laughs> they actually live lives. They have, they, 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 in some cases, they suffer a cost of living crisis from having to eat, being able to heat their home, from bad things that businesses do as well as good things that businesses do. And it's we, the, having the business people, having the consumer advocates there on the panel, mm -hmm. on the, uh, uh, advising the board, supporting us in that way, ensures that in this kind of more technocratic debate that we sometimes have, we remained gra we remain grounded in the realities of life, which is incredibly important, and life as it changes. Can I just make a bigger point even than that about independence? Unfortunately, it is a fact that the British public is skeptical about government, it's skeptical about business, and it's skeptical about regulators. Um, trust in government and trust in markets is low, and there are surveys that, you know, that, that, that show this. Having a robustly independent body which stands apart from political influence and holds those who so have market power to account, and this kind of goes back to the power agenda. I'm not sure I put the agenda in quite the way it was put earlier, but it, it, a lot of what we do is about market power. That, that's you know, one of the main reasons we're here, is to, to kind of address it when, it, when, it, when things go wrong. Um, it, that's critical to building confidence in the market economy. And that, of course, it matters to consumers. It also matters to good, responsible businesses, small businesses and larger businesses. But it also matters to investors. We know that a major driver of investment in the UK economy is our stable, predictable legal system with independent courts, and in our case, an independent competition authority. Those who may seek to undermine this for short-term benefit. So, for example, arguing that an anti-competitive merger should be cleared or a pro-competitive merger should be blocked. And we have both arguments, actually, <laughs> from time to time. But they're both of those arguments. I've said in the past, those arguments would get short shrift from us. And that's, that's not just because we have a legal duty to apply appropriate legal and economic principles, but also because if we were to succumb to those arguments, any perceived short-term gain would be far outweighed by the damage that that would do to trust in the system as a whole. And it's the integrity of the system that is an important element in what makes the UK economy open for business. Thank you so much. And I think this is a brilliant moment to bring in Justin, actually, who, of course, is himself a CEO founder and, and runs a hugely successful business, which, as Sarah mentioned, has, in fact, had some dealings with the CMA. So it's fantastic to have you on our board. Um, and, uh, and, you know, as Martin said, you know, we just have a fantastic diversity of voices there. And um, it'd be great to hear from you now from that, that sort of business perspective. Sure. So, uh, yeah, great to be here. So we... Um so I, I founded ClearScore in 2015, and we were approached by Experian uh, in 2017, who are our major competitor. Um, and uh, they offered quite a lot of money for the company, and my investors accepted that. And um, then 2018 was uh, spending time with the CMA through a phase one and then a phase two. Um, in fact, I saw Roland, who was the... Who, uh, <laughs> We reacquainted ourselves with each other <laughs> as uh, chair of the panel inquiry. And I think Martin put it very well yesterday when we were talking about, you know, what the CMA wants to do is get the right answer. But if you're, you know, one of the merging parties, you only have one right answer, right? Which is you want that thing to happen. Um, and I think I thought long and hard about it because the process was, you know, is, it is not an easy process, let's put it that way. Um, but I always felt that it was a fair process, certainly a rigorous process. Um, and, but you are under a lot of pressure from investors to get the deal through. Um, and I, I remember reflecting when the deal was effectively, it became clear that it wasn't going to go through and Experian decided to abandon the um, merger. Um, you know, really rethinking like, okay, so where are we now? Um, and that's a challenging moment for any company when that happens. 
And I think a few companies don't survive that challenge. We were lucky in the fact that we did, and I think that was testament to the fact that we were pretty thoughtful about the implication. We, le- we thought a lot actually through the process about the way the market was going to develop, and that was quite informative to the way that we rethought our strategy. And then we sort of dusted ourselves off and went back to, as we call it, plan A, which was independence. And ClearScore has done fantastically since. So we now, 22 million users are in five markets. We operate in the UK, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Um, and we serve a lot of these economic objects called consumers, right? And I spend a lot of my time talking to our users about the services that we, um, that we provide them. Um, and, you know, we, we are much bigger as a company now, 450 people um, operating out of four different offices. We opened up in um, Edinburgh. And so I think, you know, whilst at the time you feel... Uh, when, when that decision goes against you, you feel it's a difficult moment. Actually, it was the right decision. And so, you know, had you asked me several years ago, would I be sitting on the CMA board? <laughs> um, I, I probably would have said to you, what's the CMA? Um, and, and that's sort of part of the reason that I wanted to join the board when we started talking about it. Because it is incredibly important that... Um, We create an environment where entrepreneurs can succeed and feel like they are operating on a level playing field. Mm -hmm. And when you are an entrepreneur and you put your own money where your mouth is and you go into setting up a business and generally you're not paid very much and you're, you know, making tea and photocopying whilst also going to pitch to investors and all of that sort of stuff, right, it can feel like the cards are stacked against you massively. And when you see these massive companies who have entrenched positions, which actually, as an entrepreneur, you often have to use their services, right? Um, So, you know, every technology now is more or less in the cloud. You have very limited choices there. And so you you sort of sit there and you think to yourself, you know, you, you need people who are on your side. And I think to have an environment building on a lot of what Sarah and Martin have said, where that is taken very seriously from an economy perspective, where you have a a group of people, it's not just the CMA, but it's broader, that is really going to support that effort. And we'll talk about, I'll talk maybe a bit about open banking later, but, you know, open banking is a great example of a change which has created an industry. So I... Uh, you know, run a fintech, and fintech out of the UK is uh, second only now to the US. And a lot of that is to do with the fact that we had an established uh, industry in financial services, huge amounts of knowledge and expertise, and an environment where it was level playing field, more open, so that entrepreneurs could come in and create value for consumers and for businesses. And the more that we can do that, and if that's you know, part of the, the CMA, is, what, is part of that system to create that, that is going to be great for the UK. It's going to be great for SMEs. It's going to be great for consumers. And that's, what, that's why I chose to join the board. Thank you very much. I want to just come back to Martin for a second because we'll stay with mergers for a minute and then I want to come to Karen because already Justin's picking up on some of the technology pieces that we're unpacking in our AI report, but also Karen's much broader technology experience that she's already bringing to bear for the CMA. So I want to stick with mergers for a sec. So um, we've been talking about merger processes. We're obviously consulting at the moment on our phase two merger reforms, Martin. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, you know, how we think that's going to, to evolve that um, the trust that businesses have in our processes that Justin's talking about, which seems that he now has, which is good. Yeah, so, so look, when, when I took on the role of panel chair, so you come, you know, when you take on these roles, you come with baggage, some of it good, some of it bad, in terms of your previous experience. And in my case, I'd kind of done quite a lot of um, work before the CMA and the Competition Commission before that. And my view was that although the system of independent decision-making that... <laughs> we have and we previously had was very good and it, not, it, it gives rise to good decisions, there was perhaps a, a perception gap that the, the people on the front line who are the senior business leaders in relation to the parties who have mergers that we're considering or uh, involved in markets we're looking at, 
and the CMA group of decision makers, um, they, they meet very much on structured formal occasions. So everyday dealings are between the staff team and the party's advisors in most cases. As I said, I don't think that imp in impacts the quality of the decisions, but it, I think, does perhaps affect the perception of the process. And the reforms that we should be putting in place later this month aim to address this by giving business leaders the a better opportunity to directly interact with the decision-making group. So at, at two key stages. The first is at the very beginning of the inquiry. And then the second is later, once we have indicated our provisional um, conclusions. And the changes will also support slightly wider interaction across the process, including the opportunity for early discussion of potential remedies. And I, I'm excited about this because I, I think that it will be an important contribution to building trust in the system. Look, look I'm not naive. I know that when we reach a decision that people don't like, and there's always someone who doesn't like our decision. I mean, you know, either we clear a merger and third parties are not happy, we don't clear a merger, the parties are not happy. That's the nature of the world that, that we wor work in. So there will always be someone who's disappointed, or nearly always someone who's disappointed with the decisions we make. And generally, they're not going to say, you know, well, we're disappointed, but we think you got it right. We shouldn't really have embarked on this merger <laughs> process in the first place. They're going to come back with kind of reasons why they think we're wrong and so on. No, I understand that. But I think that if we can do something through those improvements in the process to build and develop further trust in the system, um, that is a positive in, uh, uh, across, the uh, uh, across the board. So I think that, that is what we're kind of seeking to do. Thank you. And I want to come to Karen. So Karen and my roles are, are both um, first roles for the CMA. So they're new roles that have been created. My acronym is easier than your acronym. <laughs> um, but do you want to explain a little bit about um, what being CDTIO means? Um, I know there's various aspects to your role. So you're, you're leading the CMA through one of our most important transformation programs, which is digital, of course. But you're also at the really, really cutting edge end of, of looking at um, technologies like AI, not just how they're impacting competition in the market, but how we also can potentially use them in our work. Do you want to kind of unpack a little bit of that for us? Yeah, let me do that. So I joined the CMA back in September and, you know, in, in what I like to think of as already a very exciting role, um, I came in to head up something called our data unit. It's an acronym. Um, and I'll touch on that in a moment and tell you just a, a, a little bit more about that. Um, and then just this month, actually, uh, we've taken the step to integrate all of our capability around data, technology, and analytics um, under one new executive uh, directorate. And I'm delighted to be heading up that directorate. It's obviously thrilling for me personally, but of course, it's not about individuals. I think actually the, the fact of the creation of this role, this role existing, is a real credit to the, the, the foresight and the vision of the CMA. Um, and, you know, why is that? Well, I think, you know, we heard very loudly and clearly in the previous panel and, you know, we'll all know from our different vantage points that, of course, um, technology really is uh, shaping the economy and, and all areas of our lives, frankly, in new and interesting ways. Um, it is creating potential already benefits, but potentially uh, going forward enormous benefits for all of us as individuals in every aspect of our lives, but have also, also, of course, some risks uh, and considerations on the downside as well. Uh, our mandate is uh, competition and consumer protection, um, part of an ecosystem, but a really important role to be playing. Uh, and we need to do that as well as we possibly can. So lots needs to go into that. And uh, we've heard about new powers and we've heard about, uh, you know, lots of things here that are really important. You know, where is my focus at in a role like this at this moment in time? I think there are two really big priorities, um, at which we're very much taking forward, but with much more still to come. I think the first is that we really need in, in every element of our work to embed 
a, a, a really uh, rich and rigorous uh, understanding of technology, the new emerging technologies themselves, uh, the ways that these are being developed and deployed across the economy, uh, how they are um, enabling different business models, potentially all of the different uh, innovation that is uh, coming through that we're seeing. We need to be, it's all very exciting, we need to be then unpacking the implications of all of that. So what actually are the shifts in the economics? How are consumers ultimately affected? What are the ramifications for competition? And then we need to be bringing that insight and intelligence into, as I say, every element of the work from the upfront horizon scanning, the thought leadership. Uh, Sarah spoke about the wider role we play in the ecosystem, as did Marcus. So important because it is an ecosystem effort ultimately. Um, but we need to bring it into all of our casework, all of our projects, all of our studies, um, right through into shaping uh, remedies and interventions, if that's uh, on the table, that are really evidence-based, really will be effective. We'll really make sure that for people, businesses and the economy, the benefits of all of this technology are maximised, but, but also that they are felt broadly and widely and fairly. Um, so that's the first priority. And then... Happily, you know, the second priority, of course, all of this innovation, all of the same technologies, vast amounts of data, new forms of data, things that five, ten years ago people never really thought of as the data, all of that can be harnessed by ourselves as um, an agency to enhance our own productivity. Sarah spoke about the importance of productivity for the economy overall. And of course, um, our own productivity is vitally important. Um, time is of the essence, uh, you know, excellent human uh, talent uh, a piece, but we need to be doing the very best we can. And that's about harnessing all of this internally, driving um, efficiency, being faster and smart about what we do, but also effectiveness. Where are the new insights? Where are the issues that actually, uh, you know, in the past we may not have been able to detect, perhaps now could detect, perhaps even at scale and bring that work through. So, you know, what are we doing? Well, and here I want to play, again, credit to the vision of the CMA because um, we have something called the data unit. It was established now around five years ago by Andrea and Stefan was the, the first head of this unit. Um, it has been doing vital work for a number of years now. It started out with a focus on data science and data engineering, but branched out into other areas where we need skill and capability. Um, today, and, and, and also I should say, it's, it's still growing. It's grown a lot under Sarah's leadership with um, a bit more to come. We've been adding new capabilities. So we have behavioral science. We heard about the consumer voice and the importance of that lens. So we're bringing that through, and of course, in lots of ways, but including through um, dedicated a rigorous scientific uh, capacity on the behavioural side. Um, we have technologists who can really kick the tires on algorithmic systems and tell you exactly how it's working and you know, uh, assess the credibility of uh, different claims about systems and bring that through into all of our work. Um, we have digital forensics teams, e-discovery teams. We've got a covert internet lab. We can actually go on that consumer journey, do all of that and capture the entire trail forensically, bring that through into our work. I'll pause there. Feel free to bring me back and I'll tell you a little I bit will. more about the impact. I mean, what I love about this is if anyone has actually read Azim's book or listened to his Exponential podcast, which I'm now plugging for him, um, but, you know, he, he talks um, in very concerned terms about what he calls the exponential gap between how regulators are capable of responding to technology changes and the way they impact society and how fast those changes come. And everything that Karen is talking about, I think, for me, is plugging that gap, right? It is speeding up how we are able to respond, the sophistication and the rapidity of that response. So, you know, I'm a big fan of your work. Um, but I want to come back to Sarah for a second because um, what Karen's talking about is really just part of the overall transformation that's going on at the CMA right now, isn't it? Yeah, we're certainly, um, we're certainly busy. So, I mean, I think, look, externally, people see a lot of the impact of our work and the way we've changed some of the, the, the sort of use of our tools. But we're also changing an awful lot about how we work. And that, I think, is so important because it is, to Karen's point, it's really about rising to the challenges that we're facing. And our focus is, is absolutely uh, kind of forensic on making sure that we're making choices all the time about 
the priorities that we should be focusing on, where we can deliver the greatest impact. Um, so, so there's a lot that we've changed. We've changed a lot about how we're thinking about building our pipeline of activity. Now, I think um, in days gone by, we were sort of quite incremental in the way that we would do that. So what's the next con consumer enforcement case we should take? What's the next market study we should do? Um, we're not doing that now. We're stopping and we're looking. We're, we're really kind of channeling our strategy and priorities. What are the issues that we see out there that really matter? Where are the problems? Where should we be active? How can we tackle that? Through which tool? Is it formal investigation? Is it informal? How can we move as quickly as possible while still being robust and rigorous? Making sure that we're not just looking at the past. You know, we've talked a lot this morning about our work in relation to AI foundation models. Uh, electric vehicle charging is another good example. We've got a really, really important role at this pivotal moment to help to shape how these markets are changing and evolving as well as fixing some of those issues of the past. Um, I want to say a word about our people. As we talked about technology, the CMA, I think, is just a unique organization. And I am so privileged to have the opportunity to lead the CMA. And the only reason that we can do the fantastic work that we deliver for people and businesses and the UK economy, the only reason that we can do that is through the fantastic contributions of every single person that works and has worked at the CMA. I got, I got an interesting fact. 2,900 people have worked at the CMA over the last 10 years. Every single one of those people has contributed to the great work that the CMA has done. So I would just like to acknowledge that. And that is why, as well as everything that we're doing to make our cases better, to deliver greater impact, to promote digital transformation, we are also on this big journey at the moment to make sure that the CMA remains the very best place to work that it can possibly be, that we offer the best opportunities, the best development, a great culture, a great environment. I think we have a phenomenal connection through everybody that works at the CMA because everybody cares so much and so deeply both about the work that we do but also about the people that work there. So kind of behind the scenes, behind the doors in this wonderful building that we have, we are doing a huge amount to continue to make the CMA a great place to work as well. Second that. Um, I think, I mean, one of the changes um, that uh, Biden... By the way, anyone who wants to come and work at the CMA... <laughs> yes, exactly. This is also a massive recruitment drive. Um, hashtag CMA at 10. Um, <laughs> but one of the changes that I know you and Marcus made very consciously, which you can tell by my role I'm a big fan of, is, is um, this decision to, to be ever more actively and openly engaging with our stakeholders and communicating what we're doing and, and why we're doing it. And I think, you know, events like this and certainly the diversity of voices that we heard on the panel yeah. this morning is an amazing testament to exactly, as you said in your speech, we are not in an ivory tower. We are absolutely listening and learning every time that we have one of these interactions and every time we do one of these events. So we're incredibly grateful also to everyone in the room because you are part of that community and that conversation that we want to have. So I think I'll, I'll come back now. Um, I know there are other things the panelists want to touch on, but I want to also give everyone an opportunity just to think about some of the big issues that were raised on that first panel. So, you know, we heard about labour markets. We heard about um, net zero um, and the CMA's role there. We heard about the concept of power. Um, and how, you know, how society feels about that, well, what the role of a competition authority is there. Um, we obviously heard about AI, and it's something, Karen, you might want to come back to as well, also in Marcus's speech. So just any sort of reflections and responses that anyone would like to give to any of that. I know, Martin, you and I were having a, a good chat in the break, weren't we? Yeah. I, mean, I said earlier that we apply an established set of legal and economic principles. Established, but, of course, you know, adapt and learning over time. But the fact that one is applying established principles doesn't mean that you operate in a vacuum in terms of the context in which those principles have to be applied. When the world changes, you either recognize that and change with it, or you become irrelevant. Yes. And that's true for businesses, it's true, and it's true for, uh, for, 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 for organizations like ours. So if you look at some of the issues that are now on our agenda, like sustainability, labor markets, digital markets, of course, these wouldn't have been on the agenda, or if they were, they were not so high up 20 years ago, perhaps not, not even 10, 10 years ago. Now, that doesn't mean that you know we can just arbitrarily 
kind of decide, or oh, this is a problem, let's think about it, and let's try and address it. That's not what we do. But we do work in a world. We, we, do, we are a learning organization. We are a knowledge-based organization. And learning involves, first of all, learning from your own experience of what has worked in the past and what doesn't. That affects our, the way we apply merger control sometime. If we feel certain approaches we've had in the past have not been effective, we learn from that and, and we change it. But learning also means um, understanding externally what is changing. So some of the things we heard about earlier, about the way the world is changing and world is developing, means we do have to think about things in a different way. Um, it is for government to decide what our powers should be, and you know that government's views change on that, and that's for them. And we will, you know, we will respond accordingly, depending on what um, the legislation says. But within that context, I think that does we, we we need to change, we need to adapt, we need to learn, and I think that's what we do. Thank you. Anybody else? I mean, I'm happy to cue off the learning, uh, you know, challenge there. I think and, and huge opportunity. So. You know, the kind of capability that I describe, which is obviously, you know, it's about uh, adding lenses and skill sets as a strong complement to everything Sarah, you know, describes as well, which is actually a building full of incredibly talented people, economists, lawyers, people with policy backgrounds, all kinds of other important skill sets. And so you add in some, some lenses here and some capabilities. And I think the investment there is, is starting to pay back or has been paying back in many ways and will, will pay back much more going forward with some of the challenges and opportunities we're talking about. We, uh, you know, when you look at our portfolio, when you look at some of the cases we're working on, increasingly complex. Um, and we, we need to be unpacking these sort of cutting edge type uh, considerations um, and doing that all live at pace. And so we're a, we've got a capability here to work with enormous data sets, uh, turn on a dime and do that almost immediately and get insight and learn um, about the real world through the lens of some of that data and bring it into the lifeblood of the organization. We can scrutinize, you know, algorithms showing up increasingly. And this is just isn't about digital in the digital sector. This is the entire economy showing up in pricing, showing up in marketing, showing up in chatbots across the entire economy. Um, we need to understand that. We need to understand the systems behind the scenes there, open the black boxes or have a cafe capacity and capability to do that, and then figure out uh, what difference that really makes to real people in the real world or competition and power and the strength of that. And then we need to be you know, turning on a dime, bringing all of that into decision making as well, as well as enhancing understanding across the ecosystem. We have an important role to play there. We've touched on that. Um, we need to be providing proactive, programmatic sort of thought leadership on um, important issues, online choice architecture, mm. uh, dark patterns across the economy. Um, can we understand them? Could we detect them? Could we potentially do that at scale? Can we send the right messages back into the economy and the acts in the economy about, uh, uh, you know, about some of the risks and considerations and the opportunities there, frankly, as well? Artificial intelligence, we've, we've touched on, you know, important topic um, a, a, among other important topics. But yes, you know, it's a general purpose technology we're talking about. Expect that to be showing up across the economy. We uh, have been in this space uh, for some time now as the CMA. Back in 2021, we published um, a paper that was quite broad based and comprehensive on algorithmic harms um, spanning from uh, algorithmic collusion over here through to um, you know what difference it might might make in terms of online choice architecture and so on and so forth and we're unpacking a load, a load of these issues and then we've continued that work and we've got technology horizon scanning as part of your wider horizon scanning program and that's why we partner so closely among many uh, reasons and we can then get ahead of things like foundation models. A couple of years ago, that popped up on our radar as an area to give a bit more focus. That led mm. to uh, recently, back in September, our first publication. Um, last week, more analysis and insight from this group, a contribution into the ecosystem to enhance understanding, but of course, we're using it ourselves internally and with more to come on that uh, front as well. So I think these are some of the ways in which um, you know we're learning and growing, but it's also about action and evidence-based decision-making today as well. And I think, uh, I, I think that's what this is about. Thank you. Just can maybe just say a quick word about 
about the labor markets piece, because I think that's a really good example of how we have moved as an organization. And, and again, a you know, big shout out, I think, for the work of the microeconomics unit. I, I don't think we would have done a piece of work like that a couple of years ago. And I don't think we would have quite known what to do with it, if I'm honest, because you know, it, you, you sort of, you look at that and you think, well, what does that mean for the CMA? And it's partly for us to take learnings from that. So when we're looking at the relationship between market power and wages, you know, we can play that right back into our cartels cases. I'm looking for Juliet, there she is. Um, and the cases that we've got around, around sort of wage fixing and making sure that we're not seeing anti-competitive conduct in that space. But I think we're also much more comfortable now as an organization contributing to the broader debate, you know, using our immense capability for analysis, but then to play that back into the broader ecosystem to say, look, we're seeing these trends, we're seeing these trends about uh, regional patterns and, and, and labor market concentration and impact on wages. We're seeing these patterns around um, collective bargaining. We're seeing these patterns around non-competes. They're not all issues that are for us to, to address. And that goes back to the discussion in the panel this morning. And I think we've, we've kind of matured as an organization to be able to say we can contribute to this broader debate. It doesn't mean that we can solve everything but we've got a really important role to play here and I think that is only going to increase in the coming years. I, I think there is a kind of danger in, 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 in that most most issues, big issues in the modern world are complex. No one policy can, 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 can solve them. No one organization can solve them. But there's a real danger of saying, well, this is all too hard. And therefore, you know, we, can, we won't make our contribution because even our contribution won't solve the problem. And if everyone says that, nothing happens. <laughs> and I, I, I think, you know, we have to recognize our limitations. Of course, we can't solve the problem of environmental uh, sustainability on our own. Of course, we can't solve the, uh, some of the issues relating to productivity and investment in innovation in the UK economy. We can't do all of, we can't solve all of those problems ourselves, but we can contribute mm. towards dealing with those problems. And if we didn't play our part, we would be abrogating yeah. the responsibility we've been given. I, and it's, it, I, I think it's critically important that the CMA remembers, and I think this is a great platform for it, and some of the messages that we've heard this morning, it is about, you know, taking all of these very... Um, you know, quite intellectual, uh, you know, approaches and analysis into the real lives of consumers, right? You know, so mm. ClearScore, you know, we, we, we have two million people who've given us open banking permissions. I spoke to one of them last week um, up, in Edim um, up in Scotland and uh, she, she was a, a user of ClearScore who didn't see any offers of credit and then she opened up her open banking and suddenly she got a credit card, right? Now, that is a direct uh, consequence of banks being forced to open up their data. And there are myriad, myriad examples of the work that the CMA does having those sort of real impacts. And I think the more that we can come to that and the more that we can talk about, you know, the, the, the innovation that we're creating to create SMEs and those SMEs hopefully becoming scale-ups and they aren't going to get gobbled up by the big uh, players potentially. We are going to create some competition and some uh, globally winning companies out of the UK, CMA has a massive role to play in that. And the more that we can focus on that and communicate that, I think the better. Thank you. I'm going to give you each a really tough question now, maybe tougher for Sarah, perhaps. Um, what, is, um, what is the one thing that, uh, if we were sitting here at CMA at 20, you would like to say that you had contributed or changed or impacted? And uh, i start with Karen. Thanks. So for me, it... You know, I'll take your one and make it two, of course. And it, you know, it comes back to these two broad priorities because they are so interlinked. Um, and you do one and you do the other, really, and you do them, you know, you do them together. So it's I want us to have done everything we we can um, at each stage in uh, in this journey to really have that understanding that we need um, about technologies, the way they are shaping uh, our lives, markets implications for consumers competition and bring that into the lifeblood of our work end to end from the upfront horizon scanning right through to sort of taking action. And um, I think that requires a lot of collaboration um, with my uh, excellent colleagues. Um, and that's one of the important ways we're going to do this. The second then, of course, is doing everything we can to be as efficient, and effective as, as an agency. And I think, you know, sort of three broad enablers I'd pull out under all of that, because that's, that's the agenda 
order, really, in terms of how you make it happen. Uh, obviously, talent. You know, Sarah, you've talked about our, our you know, incredible group of people here at the CMA. That is critical. Um, and we need to be doing everything we can to um, preserve and enhance our value proposition for some of the very best talent out there, including in the, in, in the space I'm talking about. Um, and uh, so if anybody is, uh, you know, young or old and a little unsettled out there or not moving enough, uh, you know, then do take a look at some of the excellent opportunities we have coming up. But more, you know, we do need to be thinking um, about the absolute best we can be doing for our people. And so that's a big focus. Uh, we need to tap external expertise. We have, uh, you know, with uh, Will and our digital markets unit, we've been thinking there about a digital panel. We have some excellent experts there um, who are, are looking to contribute to our work and are brought in to contribute to our work. We have excellent ties to some leading academics in relevant fields, and we use those uh, fully as well. And also, actually, you know, we have Co uh, Kate here from the, the, the DRCF, and we're all part of the DRCF. And through things like the DRCF here in the UK and our excellent program, including on AI and some shared research and focus there, um, and also internationally, these issues, as Sarah and others have, have said, of course they're global. We may be talking about global firms. We may be talking about increasingly global issues. So we need to be getting out there across the ecosystem, whether it's here in Europe or the US, and we need to be showing up, meeting the ecosystem, and really engaging and understanding these issues, helping people understand our priorities and focus and those principles, for instance, in AI, and how they're going to come through and deliver the best outcomes. And so that's really important. Just last month, I was over in Washington myself for the IC the International Competition Network's New Technologies Forum. Uh, you know, just one part in a bigger picture, but an excellent initiative that we take full advantage of to share knowledge and perspective and really engage on these issues together. So this is one thing for Karen, which is why she over-delivers so much, which is why she's so brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to Justin next, please. Um, what well, CMA 20, I would like every consumer and business in the UK to think that the CMA has their back. Hmm. Thank you. Martin. Well, I think that the, that the independent panel's work of bringing together established legal and economic thinking on the one hand, and the judgments of people from rural world backgrounds in business, consumer advocacy, the professions, and other areas on the other, has helped to deliver, when considering mergers and markets, a UK economy that is innovative, productive, and where market power is, well, where power in markets is properly mm. distributed and exercised. Thank you. Sarah, you get the last word. Well, Justin slightly stole my thunder, but I'm, I'm going to be reassured that we are very aligned <laughs> in our thinking. Um, so, look, front and centre still for me a bit, which isn't quite a CMA 20, is the bill. And I think I would like to think that whoever's in my role in, in 10 years' time is able to look back and say, actually, the CMA has delivered on the new powers that we've got, both in relation to digital markets and in relation to consumer protection. And that has made a real demonstrable difference to the experience of every consumer and business in the UK. And to kind of build on Justin's point, I would really like it to be the case that every consumer and business in the UK can kind of tangibly identify, this is one thing that the CMA has done for me. I think that would be a really great place to be. Thank you so much. Um, we've got um, just over 10 minutes for questions. Um, gosh, we've stunned everyone. Hello. Hi there, lady at the back, please. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kirsten Edwards-Warren. Um, I'm an economist. I'm also a consumer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you. It's really promising sitting here listening to how thoughtful and um, rigorous you are being about um, thinking about the impact of competition policy on, on consumers and businesses. Um, one thing I've been thinking about have you, as you've all been talking was um, the OFT used to do a really nice study of the pri where it would go out and survey the private sector and try to understand the deterrence effect of competition policy. And uh, I can see you nodding, so you've obviously been thinking about it. But I've always wondered why the CMA hasn't done that, because I think it's probably the bigger impact of what you do. And when, Sarah, you're talking about, well, we've looked at these mergers and yeah. we've prohibited these mergers, mm -hmm. I think those old studies used to find that 
for every clear score experience, sorry to open up old wounds, uh, there'd be six deals that were left on the boardroom table. Um, and so my question really is, how have you been thinking about that? And from the nodding, I think you have. <laughs> no, that's a great question. I'll let Jessica answer. Yeah, so we have been, um, we've been thinking about this both um, from within uh, my directorate in terms of strategy, um, but also working with the microeconomics unit and some of our brilliant economists, because you know, our methodology for how we calculate and demonstrate our impact should evolve. It should get better and better but it has to also be as absolutely robust as possible. Um, and so when we talk about direct financial impact, and you, everybody can see our impact assessment, which is published every year, is a, um, it, you, know, you can go and look at that document and look at the methodology, and that's the figure that Sarah talks about when she says that over the last three-year cycle for every one pound that the CMA has used on operating costs, 26 pounds have been delivered back. That is a direct financial figure that we give, right? What you're talking about, I think, and which Sarah referred to in her speech, the deterrent impact, is likely to be on the methodology you're talking about, which was done for the OFT, which we've revisited recently, multiples higher again. But of course, it's harder to, it's much harder to calculate. You know, you will never be able to be as robust and precise about that. But you, what you can do and what we're talking about doing is potentially going out and doing the surveys, doing, redoing that research, looking at some updated methodology to see if we can get to a better sense of that. Because I do think it's, it's very important, despite being a counterfactual. Um, and actually, the way that we think about doing... Um, communications even around compliance and enforcement you know with the new bill coming in we know that getting out there and actually explaining what's going to change so that businesses understand and can get the house in order so that we see things getting better for consumers on day one in some areas and then of course filtering through as we start to bring cases you now all of that will be amplified if we can go out and send that deterrent message so we're also thinking about it from that perspective Uh, thank you, uh, Jessica. My oh, name is Greg Clark. I chair the uh, Science and Technology Select Committee of the House of Commons. Uh, a question for Martin. Martin, you, um, you reflected quite rightly that you operate under the framework that Parliament gives you, the, um, the statutory framework, uh, and that includes the, the panel system um, that you chair. Um, there's a lot of fresh eyes in our system, including panels and actually uh, the CAT uh, as well. Uh, and uh, is there, how do you manage to to make sure that 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 independence those fresh eyes are consistent with a predictable strategic vision for the institution so there are there are not there are a number of factors there the first is that although the panels contain people who include people who have different backgrounds, uh, non-competition policy backgrounds. We are advised by an excellent team of lawyers, economists and others who um, are able to advise us on the kind of legal and economic kind of framework, the broader framework on which we're taking decisions. That's, that's the first point. The second point is that when we appoint, well, when appointing people to the panel, we, uh, one of the things we take into account, one of the uh, criteria is their, uh, despite the fact they have different backgrounds, is their ability to learn quickly about the framework uh, that they have to apply, the legal context. And we have a series of panel seminars, normally every about six weeks, where amongst other things we are learning, we, we will analyze a previous, a, a completed inquiry, what went right, what went wrong, what were the principles that were applied, consistency with, with other cases. We will have training uh, and support from lawyers, from economists and others as to the way that the um, system works. Of course, there is also the right of, uh, of challenge to our, uh, from our decisions to the CAT, and the CAT, through the judicial review process, lays down guidelines which we then, on particular cases, which we then study and we learn from and we apply going forward. So I think through all of that, we, we get the best of both worlds. We, we, I, we do have... Sorry, there's one other point, which is that the board lays down guidelines which we have to consider. And those guidelines we, we consider in every case, and they, of course, provide another level of consistency across the board. So I think through all of that, we get the benefit of predictability and consistency on the one hand, 
But also, in all of these cases, these are all hard cases. Cases come to phase two because they're hard. And there is always an element of judgment. This is the law, this is the economics, this is the framework in which we have to make that decision. But you've got to weigh up within that judgment. So within that um, broad kind of framework of learning and, and structure, we then use the skills of the, and the background of the independent panel me members to make those judgments on the margins. Thank you. Lady over here. Hello, uh, Sarah Long from Euclid Law. Thank you very much for a really fantastic morning. It's really great as sort of a stakeholder to be able to see some of the inner workings of the CMA. So that's very good. I just wanted to come back to Sarah, a couple of comments you made around um, the sort of CMA, the, the accusation of CMA overreach on a global scale. Now, the foundation, um, rep the, the AI report looking at foundation models is, is fantastic. I mean, it's really, really good. Does this sort of mean that the CMA is effectively going to kind of a first mover advantage in terms of AI enforcement? Because you've done, I think, a lot of work here, which is beyond what other competition authorities have done. But we're talking about global models. We're talking about global markets. And we're talking about the same companies. So a bit like with Google Privacy Sandbox, there is an opportunity for the CMA to sort of say, well, look, actually, we're going to try and put it, obviously our focus is UK consumers, it's UK business, that's all we're focused on. But actually, it's not going, the outcome is not going to be just for UK consumers and UK companies. And so I suppose my question is really, how do you balance that within your mandate, but also the, dare I say it, awesome responsibility of having these conversations with companies who are operating on a global scale? Yeah, I mean, look, we're, we're acutely conscious that particularly in these kind of markets, you know, all the issues across digital markets, they're almost inevitably digital mar uh, global markets, global issues. Um, and I think you see that in the way that we work. And actually, you know, I mean, we have, I think, done a huge amount of work in relation to foundation models to take that example. And that reflects the, the very conscious priority, as I've said, that we've put into making sure we're focusing on the future as well as the past. And we are, so I think there's a really important role for us to play in helping to shape how these markets are evolving rather than waiting until issues arise and then having to go in with really heavy handed enforcement. So that is a very conscious, that is a very conscious strategy on our part. But we're not doing that, I think, in some kind of competitive first move away, which is perhaps the way that it's sometimes portrayed. And in reality, I don't think we're doing that in a way that is very different from the thinking that's happening across every major antitrust jurisdiction that, that we see. I mean, you know, every single conference that you go to, this topic is kind of top of the agenda. I was at the ABA last week. It was on multiple panels. You know, we heard comments and discussion from the European Commission, from the FTC, from the DOJ. We know that the FTC has got their own inquiry looking at foundation model partnerships and agreements. Um, it, it is a clear area of focus for every single antitrust agency globally and rightly so because of the issues that we we have discussed this morning yes the cma i think is a really important contributor to that thinking and of course as i said earlier you know we learn from agencies one from the other there are some cases where the cma um, is evolving its thinking google privacy sandbox is a great example of that there are many other cases where we see the European Commission, the FTC, the DOJ uh, taking things forward. You know, we've obviously got major, major litigation happening uh, involving the, the, the major digital players in the US. We're seeing the groundbreaking developments that are happening in the EU with the Digital Markets Act. So I think that you're seeing these frontiers kind of constantly moving across all of the jurisdictions and we're playing a very important part in that. Uh, but I don't think it's any greater or any less than, than the other major jurisdictions. Thank you. If we've got no more questions, we are almost bang on time. Look at that. Um, I just want to, to close by saying that, um, that I've been at CMA for eight months now, um, which seems both like a second and a lifetime, um, especially in a week like this. But, um, but you know, the thing that I love and what I hoped I would find when I got here was an organisation that had real energy behind it and was really... Um, 
evolving and adapting and in touch with the world around it and what it needed to be and what it needed to become to meet the challenges and seize the opportunities. And that is absolutely what I found. Um, I think it's true when we say in our annual plan, we are listening and learning and adapting more than we ever have. Um, and I'm very proud to be a part of that. And I love the team that I'm working with um, to do that. And events like today um, are just brilliant to share all of that with our stakeholders and partners. So if we can thank the panel in the usual way. Can I just say a, a quick word of thanks? There's been a huge number of people who've been involved on the CMA side in arranging and organising this, and I'm not going to attempt to shout out to everybody who's been involved, but you all know the part that you have played, and thank you very, very much. Can I just give a particular shout out to two people, one of whom is Jessica, who has absolutely worked her socks off to pull this event together. Um, so huge, huge thanks to Jessica. The other person is Paul, who is just an absolute superstar. Paul, this couldn't have happened without you. So I just want to say a huge round of applause and thanks to both of you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And here goes for the next 10 years. There you go. Come back in five. <laughs>